There are motions to this. The clerk will report the bill. Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I move that House File Number 5242 be taken from the table. Representative Long moves that House File 52. 5242. 5242 be taken from the table. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. The motion prevails. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> House file number 5242, an act relating to transportation, number four on the calendar, the second engrossment. There are amendments at the desk. If there are uh, no objections, we will let the author explain the bill before we act on amendments. Representative Horstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, this is the um, Transportation Finance Supplemental Bill for 2024. We had a lot of success on the policy bill, a lot of good work done on that, and now we're moving on to finance. Uh, before we do that, though, um, again, I really appreciated what Representative Keeler said about our amazing staff, and we have incredible staff um, uh, working on transportation, so I just want to acknowledge them and thank them. Uh, Ten Tenzin Sangyang is the uh, committee legislative assistant. Um, uh, Matt Bauman is our committee administrator. Uh, Kyle Schwab, DFL Research, did a great job in his first year. Joe Marble. Republican Research did a great job in his, I guess, 20th year. I have no idea how long he's been here, but it's good to work with Joe. Um, Andy Lee uh, is our House Fiscal Analyst. Amazing um, work he does, along with Matt Burris from House Research. Um, we have fantastic members on our committee. Um, Representative Tabke, the Vice Chair, is not here today, but I wanted to thank him, acknowledge him. And uh, Aaron Cagle is the chair of the Sustainable Infrastructure Committee, but made a lot of contributions to this bill. And of course, Representative Petersburg, uh, who is a true friend, and um, this year, as in past years, has been very, very helpful with process issues, ideas, suggestions. Uh, Representative Petersburg, thank you so much uh, for your partnership this year and over the years. So. Um, Members, I just wanted to, uh, time is short, so I just want to briefly highlight uh, some of the items in this bill that uh, are very important. Um, I think in putting together any transportation bill, be it policy, be it finance, uh, we should include a, a multimodal approach. Uh, we should create jobs through the bill, uh, improve safety, uh, acknowledge the fact, as uh, my seatmate, Representative Kraft, has done, repeatedly that climate change is the number, uh, uh, transportation is the number one source of uh, climate uh, change in the state and increasingly around the world, so we have provisions uh, on that in the bill. Um, and then um, uh, other uh, uh, areas uh, of, of note are that investment in basic infrastructure. And so uh, we have trunk highway cash in this bill um, our general fund target was very small, uh, $2 million, but we did have trunk highway cash available to us. And uh, what we did with the bulk of that uh, was to invest in uh, what MnDOT calls high priority bridges. And bridges are in the news again. Of course, we, we had the tragedy um, in our state, uh, and then of course we've bridge infrastructure in the news nationally and, and locally as well. And so I just wanted to highlight, uh, even though all of these counties are not getting their high priority bridges funded in this bill, we're making a start. And again, many of them are uh, in, in your districts. Um, for example, there's 16 counties uh, in greater Minnesota that are on the high priority bridge list uh, of MnDOTs. Those include St. Louis, um, Carleton, Kitson, Marshall, Stearns, Malax, Morris, and Clay. This is starting to sound like a severe thunderstorm watch. I don't know. Um, Otter Tail, uh, Mauer, Freeborn, Winona, Blue Earth, Rock, Cottonwood, and in the Metro, uh, Chippewa, and then in the Metro, Hen Hennepin, Ramsey, and Dakota have 
high priority bridges that need to be repaired. So um, uh, that is an important part of our bill. Um, we add um, 32 new testers uh, who are, are going to be um, helping out with uh, driver testing. Um, that's been a high priority uh, over the years, and so we add 32 uh, additional testers. Um, as I uh, mentioned, uh, Representative Kraft has been working hard uh, throughout the interim, um, and, he, and I'm, there'll be amendments, and he can talk more about um, his work with the Impact Mitigation Working Group. Um, we have $9 million for small cities, uh, one time, and then in our transportation advancement account that we passed last year, that will be ramping up very quickly, but we wanted to uh, fill a hole in the uh, uh, needs of small cities, and we do that um, in this bill. Um, and then we also have some uh, provisions uh, related to transit, uh, and um, uh, we'll certainly be uh, excited about the second train to Chicago, which is going to start on May 21st. The tickets went on sale today. And um, we have some uh, provisions that allow for indemnification at Union Station. So uh, with that, members, uh, that is sort of a, a broad general overview of the transportation portion of uh, House File 5242. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Hornstein moves to amend House File Number 5240 to the second engrossment. The amendment is coded A91. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Hornstein, to explain the amendment. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. Um, Chair Lee uh, had brought to the committee uh, some provisions around zero emission buses, a uh, very important uh, trend in uh, transit. Um, there were some concerns around implementation. Uh, of those provisions, and so this um, uh, amendment uh, establishes a, a transition strategy uh, for the Metropolitan Council uh, and uh, the, a plan that they would be uh, uh, implementing by January 1st, 2035, uh, to have a, a zero emission bus fleet. And I ask for your support. Discussion to the amendment. There being no discussion to the amendment, all those in favor say aye. aye. Oh, my apologies. There is discussion to the amendment. We will recall that vote after discussion. To the member from uh, Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And and uh, Mr. Chair, this was a, one of the areas that I had a concern with because the way the bill originally had the bill, um, I was going to be calling this bill the mega bus bill because of the mega cost that it was. I think your your amendment uh, did a lot to Im improve that. So now we can go back to just an omnibus bill uh, because it's not quite as, as large. It was going to be pr presenting a six and a half billion dollar cost over 10 years, which was just unmanageable and would actually set them up for failure. So this is a, a, a much better improvement and I don't see a problem with it one way or the other, although we'll certainly be talking about it later. Any further discussion? There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Fogelman moves to amend House Law Number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. Amendment is coded A58. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Nobles, uh, Noble Representative Fogelman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, I think this is a good amendment. Um, this deals with the blackout plates, and if you've read anything about those in the news lately, the blackout plates are one of the state's most popular plates and a great revenue generator. The first three months of sale, nearly 50,000 plates are on vehicles traveling in the state with expected sales of 160,000 plates this year. This amendment seeks to take any revenue over the first 4.8 million, which goes to the Department of Public Safety, and give funds to the deputy registrars. 
The deputy registrars usually get the, the funds from licensing, but with people doing a lot more stuff online, they aren't getting the funding that they are used to getting. So anything that would be generated over the first 4.8 million would help keep deputy registrars open in the state. So let's keep our local offices open and vote green on this amendment. And Madam Chair, I ask for a roll call on this amendment. A roll call has been requested, are there 15 hands? Can you hold your hands up again just to me? I don't see, if I've seen 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion to the amendment, Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the uh, uh, amendment. Um, I agree that uh, this is a potential new source of revenue. Uh, we're doing well, relatively well, the first year. Um, but I don't want to get boxed in into one uh, specific use for this. And so uh, maybe down the road we can, we can look at that. But um, uh, at this point, I would ask for a no vote. Further discussion? Representative Fogelman. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Madam Speaker. So I think a, a little bit of back history about why we chose um, uh, the $4.8 million. That is because the fiscal note uh, has suggested that they're anticipating 160000 uh, That fiscal note had $4.8 million in it. That was what the budget and, and the bill put forth as being going to the Department of uh, vehicle services uh, that goes into a special revenue account, okay? Uh, and they really don't have a real good answer for what they're going to spend it on. But this just says, okay, so if it goes above and beyond that, and you're not even planning for it uh, in your budget proposal, then let's use the excess to help with another uh, portion of the department, which is the deputy registers, who we know is still sucking air from the Minlar's uh, fiasco, et cetera. So I think it's appropriate for us to use this number, and I think it's appropriate for us as a legislature to have some input into why and where excess funds that we're planning on getting, if there is plans on getting it extra. I mean, if it, if it doesn't get to be 4.8 or it's less, then nothing changes. But if it goes more than that, it certainly makes sense that it go into vehicle services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would urge a green vote. To the member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I need to uh, correct the information for the people on the floor. If we come up with a better idea to use the excess money, then we pass it in a bill when that idea comes, and it's to fruition. So right now, and, and also the other comment about 4.8, you know, that's a lot, you know, it might not be doing as well. Well, if it doesn't do well, then none of it will go into this. So I think both of the areas that we're commenting about not doing this amendment, um, I think have been addressed, so let's vote green. Further discussion, Representative Fogelman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a note that this money that's over the 4.8 million, I mean, that's a lot already. So. Let's put this into transportation. This is a transportation fund. Let's put it into transportation things like the deputy registrar, which are desperately needing of funds right now. Let's keep them open. So members, please vote green. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. <clears throat> the chief clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll.
There being 62 yeas and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Petersburg moves to amend House file number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A47. To the author of the amendment, the member from Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and this is a, a, a bill related to bus rapid transit and arterial uh, bus rapid transit programs and how um, we deal with the intersections around them. And uh, so before we get started, I, I'm guessing I'm not going to get the chair's approval on this one. So I'm going to request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Petersburg. Okay. Oh, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker. So in the bill, uh, there is a, a, re a requirement that the Met Council, through their budgeting uh, process, has to redo all four uh, corners of an intersection that is along a transit way. That's including regular bus routes and including all the other uh, routes that are along there. Currently, uh, only the corner where the bus is actually going to be stopping, usually their kitty corner from each other, are, are totally handicap accessible. And this bill just simply says that only those in which there is a stop for arterial bus route and bus rapid transit would have to have these upgrades to it. If we don't do this, uh, virtually all of the dollars that are coming to the Met Council for um, the excess uh, sales tax are going to be paying for this. On top of it, uh, the other intersections that are along there, which is really a responsibility of the city, uh, the cities are not going to be paying for that, even though they're getting a percentage of the sales tax uh, that is the excess sales tax that's coming in for transit. It seems unfair for us to expect uh, the dollars that we're really trying to get in towards better uh, bus rapid transit and so forth, having to go to these infrastructure. Uh, the, the cost that we're hearing is anywhere to, to 40 to $70 million uh, to do this uh, without the ability to, to um, that's just for the four uh, lines that are being built now. Uh, to retrofit the others is going to be even a higher cost. So this makes perfect sense to me. I would urge a green vote. Uh, let's, um, let's get the, the funding and the responsibilities for the upgrades um, where they're necessary and where they're appropriate, uh, and by far um, the best use of the funds. I'm not saying we shouldn't make everything handicap accessible, but we need to do it in a, in a way it makes sense. So I'd urge a green vote. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Sensor Mira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, um, I would encourage a no vote on this amendment. Thank you uh, for the points that you raised, Representative um, our Lead Petersburg. Um, I would encourage a no vote because we have done significant work in this bill to talk about this issue of bus rapid transit scoping. And I know that Chair Hornstein um, has made a commitment to continue to talk about this issue within conference. Um, we are trying to find the best way to give the county and Met Council clarity about exactly the way that who should pay and how they should think about these um, projects as they relate to accessibility and also putting in the things that we know help bus rapid transit or that we have learned help bus rapid transit move um, smoothly. So at this time, I would encourage a no vote. I think that there is still discussion um, further on this bill, and I know that Chair Hornstein is committed to doing that in conference. Thank you. Further discussion to the amendment. Representative Petersburg. Uh, th thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I think I gave the best uh, reasons in my previous uh, discussion. Uh, I just would say, look, we have to start figuring out how we prioritize the funding, and we can't just create an arbitrary hole in which we say, hey, you guys go fund it. Um, that doesn't make sense because guess who's going to come back later and want us to fill that hole? Let's make some sense out of this. Uh, this is a time in which we can continue to work on this. This isn't going to be able to be accomplished in just the next 12 months. Uh, so let's keep working on it, and please, um, I'm asking for a green vote. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Carol. <clears throat> Carol, no.
Carroll, no. Howard. <clears throat> Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. <clears throat> the clerk will close the roll. There being 62 yeas and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Gilman moves to amend House Bill number 5242. The second engrossment has amended. The amendment is coded A86. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Meeker, Representative Gilman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Appreciate it. I am very excited to talk about this amendment tonight, folks. I'm a co-author on this bi bipartisan bill that's going to be offered in the House as well as in the Senate. What this amendment does, what this bill does, is ensure that motorcyclists have options in stop-and-go traffic. I'll repeat that again. What this bill does is ensure that there's options for motorcyclists to have options in stop-and-go traffic. Some of you in this room may think, oh no, this is super scary to talk about lane splitting. This sounds awful. This is scary. I know there's people in the room that have probably had a motorcycle weave in and out of traffic by them before, and it scared you as you've been in a vehicle. I may also um, think that you may not be a motorcyclist <laughs> if you're scared by that. I mean, what this, what this amendment does is it ensures that you can only go 15 miles an hour over the speed of traffic around you with a max speed of 40 miles per hour. It also allows um, for me as an avid motorcyclist to not be a sitting duck in traffic. I just looked up some stats right now on distracted driving and it, there's been a major uptick all across the nation and the world because of these little devices right here. Um, and so last year alone there's 29 deaths um, through distracted driving. 150 that have been injured, you know, had major injuries and over 30,000 distracted driving accidents. When you're on a motorcycle as a passenger or a driver of a motorcycle, I'm already assuming a higher risk because I don't have the protection of my vehicle around me. I don't have all the great things like airbags or any of that. Um, so I assume all risk and responsibility. And I'd encourage members here if you're curious, um, and we've talked about electric bikes, I would even encourage you to go take over in the parking lot here. They have, um, they've got, um, you, can, you don't even have to own a motorcycle, but you can go take a class. It takes two days, and you can learn about motorcycle, being a motorcycle enthusiast like me. But it's made me a better driver in my vehicle, like when I'm driving my kids around, and it's also made me more aware to be a, a motorcycle driver myself. What this bill does not do, what this amendment does not do, is it does not allow me to just, I'm, I'm late for work, so I'm going to weave in and out of traffic to get there faster. It does not allow that at all. It does not allow me to be reckless um, in traffic. Um, six states have already passed this similar legislation. Eight states right now currently are considering passing it in their states. Um, and it's been accepted with bipartisan support. I just talked to the senators, um, and it's in, gonna be in conference committee over there. And I'm just gonna talk about one more thing. What else am I gonna talk about here? Again, it's, this bill is for the safety of the motorcyclist in traffic. And I, and I know there's people on the floor here that have experiences, so thank you so much. I recognize the member from Washington, Representative Cha. Thank you, <clears throat> Representative Gilman, for this bill. Uh, many of you may not know this, but I have riding experience of 28 years as a motorcyclist. Not only that, but I spent about 20 years in California where lane splitting was legal. And I would tell you that it does save lives, and I think it's a good bill. Um, and I'll give you a couple of reasons. Um, I ride a 1973 CB500 Honda, and it doesn't have a fan on it. So when I'm in traffic in 100 degree weather, I need to continuously keep my motorcycle moving forward or else it will overheat. 
And so um, based on some technical modification, I could put a fan on it, but in 1973, those motorcycles don't have fans on it. So the motorcycle does overheat. Number two is that when you're on the freeway and the traffic comes to a slow halt or stop, there's no way for a motorcycle to go if they get rear-ended. Rear-ended uh, rear uh, motorcycle accidents are deadly, they're very dangerous, and they result in deaths. But if you're allowed to lane split, you do find safety in between the cars and between the lanes. And that gives you a little bit more of a chance of surviving shall you be rear-ended, especially on the freeway. Um, Also, it's really about safety. And the safety that um, many of us be more cyclists is that there's a lot of blind spots in the cars. And you know, it just gives us a, safe, a sense of safety when we have an area where we can go between the cars and splitting the lanes. But on top of that, allowing us to get to the front of any traffic gives us a chance to surviving a motorcycle accident. So thank you, and I just want to share that two cents with everybody. Discussion to the amendment. Representative Gilman. Thank you so much. I am just, again, grateful that I could bring this forward at this time. Um, as we're working through things through conference committee, I would just ask that we would withdraw this amendment, and I, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Representative Gilman withdraws the A86 amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> the clerk will report the amendment. West moves to amend House Bill number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The uh, amendment is coded 8A89. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Anoka, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Chair. $6.6 billion. $6.6 billion is the need of our highway system in Minship today. And I know the chair doesn't drive, but that is oh, a big so deal. Good. That is an insurmountable number if we do not prioritize it. We need to make sure we're building out our highway system in our states, particularly because that's what most people do. Most people have a car and drive a car. But it also helps commerce because even if it arrives on a plane or a train, generally it is an automobile that takes any of our commerce and the products we love to buy to its final destination. And so when there's allocations in a bill for beautification and trees and in a transportation bill, no less planting trees in a bill planting trees from the Trunk Highway Fund, it's like, I don't think Minnesotans expect us to use money in the Trunk Highway Fund, it's right in the name, to plant trees. And I understand trees do improve the beautification of our roads, but when we have a $6.6 .6 billion need, well, maybe we need to focus on the roads and not the trees. So what my amendment does is says, well, let's take that money and the Commissioner of Transportation must ensure that any feasible project is funded before we use the money for planting trees to plant trees. It's genuinely common sense. I think if you talk to the average Minnesotan, they would be shocked if this wasn't the case. It's a reasonable amendment. It's what the residents of Minnesota expect us to do, is to spend trunk highway funds on trunk highways. So I urge members to support my amendment to do this. And do I? It's a roll call. Sorry. Do I? Roll call. And I request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. To the member from Hennepin, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you, uh, Representative West, uh, for acknowledging the, the need we have uh, in our roadways. And we made a 
pretty significant dent in that last year, but of course there's still a lot left to do. Um, this uh, type of program is very helpful uh, to, it's not simply beautification. We did living snow fences last year in the uh, transportation bill. And what we found out in, in our conversation about that uh, issue is that uh, this actually saves a lot of money in plowing. Uh, you know, the, the, the trees are actually able to um, act as buffers, and that makes our roads safer. And so it's not simply a beautification, but it's actually a very practical way uh, to, to, in the end, save money and make our roads safer. So uh, while I understand where you're coming from, uh, I, I would uh, ask for a no vote. Further discussion on the amendment? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 yeas and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Robbins moves to amend House Bill number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A48. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member for Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I'm bringing this amendment forward <coughs> um, after uh, several months of talking to uh, my constituents who were affected by this situation. And I'm just gonna briefly share a little bit of their very tragic story. And the reason I'm bringing it forward as an amendment is um, we've been working on this since last fall and we just didn't get the final language right and in agreement with DPS and everything to meet deadlines. So that's why it's coming forward now tonight. Um, but this is a very sad story, and um, the, the constituents live in my district who brought it to me, and their grandma was the victim of this uh, criminal vehicular homicide in Plymouth. And the person who killed their grandma prior to the accident had been, seven, had been ticketed seven times in the last um, two years for uh, speeding. And a couple months before the accident, he was ticketed for going 99 miles an hour in a 60 mile an hour zone. Then on May 6th, as the reconstruction of the accident proved, five seconds before the crash, he was going 95.7 miles an hour. And at the actual time of the crash, they estimate it was between 68 and 77 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour zone. And um, the constituents reached out to me after the litigation and the court case was over because they were so frustrated that even though this person was clearly at fault and they had been going at these excessive rates of speed, the Minnesota law had a hole in it. They kept being told by the different investigators saying, you, you only um, revoke the license when, or suspend the license when it's um, involving alcohol or another type of impairment, not just for excessive speed. So I reached out to the department and I started working with them on this and they said, actually, that is true. There are lots of regulations in statute about when a driver's license must be revoked and, and purely excessive speed not related to alcohol or other impairment doesn't qualify. 
So anyway, that's how we ended up with this language we have. And um, I did just reconfirm with the department yesterday that they're officially neutral on this language because it is not a governor's proposal, but they think it's workable and acceptable and, and they were happy to work with me on it. So members, basically, just to summarize, this language would, would um, the effect of this language is that DPS would suspend the license of any person when a peace officer certifies that there's probable cause to believe the person committed any of um, the offenses um, of limiting the suspension to situations that currently only involve alcohol or other substance impairment. And that's really critical because it, if they only need, if you have to wait till the conviction, the person continues to drive. And that's what happened in this case. The person who did this um, lives in the neighborhood of my constituent and they would continue to see this person driving, even though that person had killed their grandmother. And it caused great hardship. So I um, appreciate you hearing this. I have had conversations with Chair Hornstein and with Chair Moeller, um, and it would have to go through both transportation and um, judiciary. And Chair Moeller has already co-authored the bill and agreed to hear it next year. And so just for respect for the process, um, she, and I respect her, her respect for the process. We're going to um, work on this next year. But members, I really want to flag this for you, and I hope all of you will co-author this, because excessive speed is an increasing problem on our roads across the state. And I hear this from my law enforcement. I know you hear it from your law enforcement. So this is a, a really tangible thing we can do to close a very small loophole in state law. And I look forward to working on it next year. Thank you, Chair Muller and Chair Hornstein. I withdraw the amendment. Representative Robbins withdraws the amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> West moves to amend House Bill number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A35. To the author of the amendment, the member from Anoka, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the A35 amendment allows a project or portfolio that does not include a project that is funded wholly in part under section 161.008 that is included in the transportation investment category established by the Minnesota Investment Plan under Section 17403, Subdivision 1C. Now, that probably sounded like gibberish because I skipped over a few words, but why that's important is because we do not want to impede the safety of our roadways today for the potential safety down the road. Because with these new greenhouse gas assessments that are in this bill, Projects could be delayed because they allow more cars on the road. They have to compete with light rail. They have to compete with like a bike path or a pedestrian bridge. And those, oh, well, those definitely lower greenhouse gas emissions. But oh, building another section of Highway 65 doesn't. And that is a significant problem. Because, for example, in the scoring system under the, Chamber of Con uh, the corridors of commerce, Highway 65 was the last thing funded in the regional section at $30 million. But if we're going to add new barriers to building new roads, that jeopardizes other parts of Highway 65, which is incredibly important because that is a complete and total nightmare in Blaine. And I know there's a strong desire in the House to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but Minnesota is not a big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, the United States, the last few years, has been trending downwards in our greenhouse gas emissions. We're on the right track. That's exactly where we want to be, headed in the right direction. You know, so the entire concept that this is actually going to help that issue is ludicrous because we are a tiny, tiny, tiny little drop. But you know who is a large drop? China. 12,295.62 metric tons of emissions compared to the United States, just over 5,000. Then the next several countries, we have India, Brazil, Indonesia, 
their greenhouse gas emissions are skyrocketing because they're rapidly industrializing countries. So why would we sacrifice the safety of today for the theoretical safety of tomorrow when these other countries likely are going to completely ignore this issue? We should be taking care of Minnesota residents. So by prioritizing road safety over these greenhouse gas emission targets, we will save lives, we will keep projects moving, and we will do what Minnesotans expect us to do. Again, Minnesotans expect us to build out our highway system because the vast majority of Minnesotans drive cars. It'd be wonderful if we all could bike. It'd be wonderful if we all could take a stroll to work. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the people here live many, 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 many miles away. So the A35 amendment will ensure that we can not allow this new mandate that was passed last year to slow down projects like Highway 65, to endanger residents by not prioritizing safety for this theoretical future safety that if you look at the numbers, this won't even be not even 1%, not even a tenth of percent, likely 0.000001% reduction. So while we can work towards lowering greenhouse gas emissions, and we are as a country and a state, we're trending downwards, this is not the way to do it. We should not do this at the cost of the safety on our roads and the expansion of Highway 65. And with that, members, I urge your support and request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. I recognize the member from Heaven Pen, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative West. Um, so i point out first that this bill that's now incorporated in the transportation bill was the result of the impact mitigation working group that we put in place last year. So we, we've passed this. Um, and this is not one of their requests. So everything else that I've put in the bill has been a result of their requests. So I'm going to recommend a no vote. And I want to get to a, kind of a fundamental point here that Representative West was making. But we all need to just reject the notion that we can have safe roads or we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and do our part, do our part to help keep the planet habitable for our kids, grandkids, and future generations. It's just a false premise. I reject that choice. And um, I'll give you something to back that up. Back almost 30 years ago, a program was put in place for wetlands mitigation. All road projects have to pass this test whether they are going to impair wetlands in Minnesota. All road projects, for whatever purpose, whether they're for commerce, for safety, whatever. If they are going to impact wetlands, the first thing they need to do is figure out if it can be avoided within the project itself. And after that, if it can't be avoided, then mitigation has to happen. Hopefully locally, if not regionally, and if not somewhere else in the state. Now, if what I said sounds familiar, it's because it's pretty much the same process we've put in place around greenhouse gas and VMT mitigation. Now, when this was put in place, I couldn't go back and find everything about it, but there was, there was big controversy, right? What, ha what we're trying to do here is change a system, right? We have to change our system the way we think about transportation. We must reduce greenhouse gas emissions. When you're trying to change an entrenched system, the system fights back. It says it's too hard. It says it's too expensive. But, right, we can do this. We've done it before. We're doing this in a responsible way. The implementation date is in February of 2025. This impact mitigation working group did some phenomenal work and came up with some recommendations that I've incorporated in the bill to make this uh, effectively work better. Um, but, but, but succumbing to fear that this is going to stop 
road safety is just wrong. Right? We've made it clear in, uh, in the bill that this does not supplant safety, that it's core to what MnDOT does, and we'll continue to do that. Um, I also want to talk about the point of, well, Minnesota is not a big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. You can make that same statement for any significant challenge that's faced globally. You could, you could look back at World War II and say, boy, the number of people from my community that actually went off to fight is small, so what, what, what does it matter if they didn't go? This is the same level problem. We have to do our part. We can lead. We can provide examples for others. And by the way, when we do this and we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we reduce vehicle miles traveled, the other things that happen is that we reduce air pollution, right? We reduce road traffic. We make our roads safer. We also provide more time for people to be in community. So this is... Um, the underlying stuff is good. I ask you to reject this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion to the amendment. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, if it is a false premise and this does not impact safety, well, then we can do it. Then there's no reason not to. If it doesn't actually impact safety and prioritizing safety is what this amendment does, great. Let's adopt this amendment. There's, there's no issue. And that tells you, well, there probably is an issue, which is why we should adopt this amendment. And it's not succumbing to fear. It's about representing our constituents. People drive cars. When you talk about lowering vehicle miles traveled, it's like, OK, you're going to do that by raising the cost of driving your car? You're going to raise the cost on Minnesotans just for your goals? And it's, so if you think about, okay, I, that war analogy is interesting. So there is one very famous regiment in Minnesota, the 1st Minnesota. It was a very small part of the Union Army at Gettysburg who suffered catastrophic casualties defending against Pickett's charge. They were the difference in the signature battle of the Civil War. And that was just, oh, just a small. So it can be small and make a big difference in war. But we're talking about globally, billions of people, not just one country, not just one continent, billions. So it's just a little trillions, really, if you think about metric tons of emissions. It's just a little drop in the bucket that will make no positive difference for Minnesotans. It genuinely won't. You, like, it's impossible to make the argument that it'll make a positive impact in Minnesotans because it is 0.000001%. So thankfully, you said this, this is not impact safety. If it doesn't impact safety, let's prioritize safety, just in case it impacts safety down the road. It's a simple little amendment. Let's prioritize safety. Let's prioritize Highway 65 and ensure Minnesotans get what they expect from government. And that is well-functioning highways and a reasonable system that prioritizes things that matter. I urge a green vote. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The Chief Clerk will close the roll.
There being 63 yeas and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Petersburg moves to amend House Law number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A44. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Waseca, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and let's try this again. We're going we're to be talking about the, the comparison between safety and other environmental concerns uh, a couple of times, and so I know that we'll get the same uh, pushback on it, but, but let's talk a little bit about what the Constitution gives this body the responsibility to do. Uh, there are really only three things that they uh, that we are assigned responsibility for. One is providing the funding for K-12 education. That's limited, by the way, to just the funding for K-12 education. Uh, the other is a, a public safety and keeping everybody safe. And the third is infrastructure, roads and bridges, buildings, okay? And so when we start talking about what our responsibility is as a the legislature, and we start dealing with transportation, roads and bridges, uh, keeping people uh, have the ability to be mobile and move around, uh, transit, uh, allowing those that, that need that kind of uh, transportation service. Uh, we need to also understand that we have a safety responsibility there as well. And so you heard a little bit ago that a, a working group was put together uh, to deal with how we can reduce greenhouse gases. Well, that's a far different responsibility than what our responsibility here is state legislature. And so to, to say, well, they wanted this and they put it in, but their scope of responsibility was different, okay? Ours is, is quite a lot uh, more expansive than, than what the feel good feel about reducing some greenhouse gases. I would hate to think that what we say is we have to mitigate greenhouse gases first before we protect people from being killed at an intersection. I don't think anybody wants us to do that, right? And yet, when we say, when some, somebody's safety or the safety is not a primary concern and has an opportunity to say, we, we think safety is a bigger importance than whether or not we can mitigate greenhouse gases, uh, then we're, what we're saying is that, well, we can't get to this improvement of this intersection, make it safe, and if somebody gets killed, well, for the better good, we're gonna, in, we're gonna help with greenhouse gases. Well, if somebody does get killed and, and we knew that there was an unsafe intersection, aren't we gonna get called on the carpet for that? Here's an op another opportunity in which we said, we need to prioritize that. We need to prioritize the safety, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think another comment was made about mitigation. And there was made some comparison about wetland mitigation. However, the legislature specifically gave the options for that mitigation. Here, we don't have any mitigation uh, systems that would actually guarantee that you can mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so we're just saying, look, if we're going to prioritize if we're going to say, hey, we can do this project or not do this project, but safety isn't going to be of, of utmost concern, then we have said safety is secondary. You can't have it even without make it into a priority. Having it equal is the same as saying, well, but it's not a priority. Because two things that have the same value aren't a priority. They just aren't. And so I'm, I'm asking for a green vote on this. I'm asking for a roll call because I think it's important. Um, a roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Because Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. You guys are pretty close to not having 15 hands, though. I, I could put Representative Petersburg. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we're, we're, we're getting a little bit tired over here. That's all. Uh, and I think maybe it's because some of us is eaten, and so it's, uh, we're kind of, anyway. We really do need to understand that we are right now on the state roads of Minnesota. People are getting killed on the roads, okay? That's a fact. That's a fact. And, and it's abrupt. It's not over a period of time. It's abrupt. And we need to take that seriously. Safety has to be a concern for us. 
And this particularly says when you're going to do an expansion or a new project, that safety uh, has to be one of those primary pieces. And so with that, uh, Madam Speaker, I would request a yes vote. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, Representative Petersburg. I appreciate your comments. This is the A44 we're talking about, correct? Um, so a few, few things. Again, it's just not you know, safety on roads versus greenhouse gas emissions. It's just not that way. Um, it's not safety versus wetlands mitigation. We've been doing that for almost 30 years. Uh, we can respond and do immediate safety things and we can make these kinds of changes in the way we approach transportation that will improve, further improve safety um, over time. So I would say that this is a safety bill and safety approach. Now, um, you also talked about this working group. We set the scope of this bill last year, and then we set the scope of that impact mitigation working group. They were to talk about how best to implement some of the portions of it. And what is, what is in the bill now is based on how do we, their guidance on how best to implement it. Now, when I actually read uh, your amendment, Representative Petersburg, what it actually does, it's not really directly related to the bill. It really looks like a new bill to me in that it prioritizes mobility and capacity expansion projects that are, that are related to safety over active transportation projects. It's not related to the underlying bill. It just it looks like a new bill to me. Um, and it's, it's not been heard. I mean, I guess we could have that discussion. I wouldn't be in favor of that. But it doesn't appear to me to be directly related to my bill. And so I will uh, request a no vote. Further discussion to the amendment. Representative Petersburg. Uh, th thank you, Madam Speaker. Maybe we'll have this discussion in the next one, but there's no guarantee that we can mitigate and still do the safety. You say we can do both, but the point is, is that if we can't mitigate the greenhouse gases, whether it's there's safety issues related to it or not, we don't do the project. That's limiting. That's not saying we can do both. And that's the problem, uh, because we, we don't we put a stopgap on greenhouse gases as the priority rather than safety. And so again, for that very purpose, I think we should have a green vote. Thank you. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The chief, clerk, the chief clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. <clears throat> The clerk will close the roll. There being 63 yeas and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> the clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Petersburg moves to amend House Law number 5242, the second and gross one as amended. The amendment is coded A76. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and this one is, is fairly similar, only the fact that it says in regards to vehicle miles traveled and, and greenhouse gases and so forth, uh, that those are secondary to... One second, yeah. Representative Petersburg. Members, excuse me. Members, if you could please take your conversations off of the House floor. The noise cross is really loud and makes it very difficult to hear the member who has the floor. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. 
Uh, th thank you, Madam Speaker. This basically talks about vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gases, uh, a lot of the things that we uh, have in this bill uh, that helps us mitigate some of the greenhouse gases, which I don't have a problem with us trying to reduce greenhouse gases. My problem is that they are prioritized over uh, safety. And this just says that uh, those particular areas, greenhouse gases, vehicle miles travel, uh, are important, but they are secondary uh, to safety because we've talked a lot about child safety here today. We talked about a lot of other things, uh, but we have to be consistent. If we're not consistent in safety, uh, then, then we're just all over the place. This is again, another situation in which I would argue is important for us to understand that our primary responsibility is people, keep people safe today and then do whatever we can into the future to deal with greenhouse gases, vehicle miles uh, traveled, et cetera. But to not put safety ahead of all of those is a big mistake and I believe has long-standing future consequences that none of us really want to have. So I'm requesting a roll call on this particular motion. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Petersburg. And I would request a green vote. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Petersburg. Um, well, again, uh, safety is not secondary. Uh, in MnDOT's core values, there are six of them, safety, service, equity, sustainability, innovation, and collaboration. Those aren't changing. We made it very clear. Safety is the first one in that list. Um, you know, as I said, we have a, a um, wetlands mitigation process that has been in place for almost 30 years, that all projects have to meet that test, regardless of what they're for, and we are still making progress on safety. Um, the other thing I would say is, if you look at the, the amendment you've put together here, uh, what you've done is there's a list of actually 16 different transportation goals. We've been operating for quite some time with, with those goals. This is the first time that is, a, and, and let me read you some of those. Minimize fatalities and injuries, multimodal and intermodal transportation facilities, reasonable travel time, economic development, encourage tourism, provide transit services, promote accountability, maximize long-term benefits, ensure that the infrastructure is maintained in a state of good repair, planning and implementation, promote high, high occupancy vehicles and low emission vehicles, air transportation system, increase use of transit, promote and increase bicycling and walking. And now we have also greenhouse gas emissions and, and the, one you, the other one you said is uh, minimal impact on the environment. So we've been operating for years, decades, with multiple goals. This is doable. This is a, a bill that will keep current safety and improve that over time. And so with that, I would encourage a no vote. Discussion to the amendment. Representative Petersburg. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and I think I'm going to, I don't generally ask anybody to yield, but I'm gonna ask if a representative um, would, would yield to the question. Kraft, Representative Kraft. He will yield to our question, Representative Petersburg. In reviewing and hearing the greenhouse gas bill that got incorporated into this bill uh, at committee, it was very apparent that the mitigation of the greenhouse gases and vehicle miles traveled was going to be the trumping factor in regards to any project being pushed forward. What I'm wondering from you, and I'd like to make sure that we, when we talk about this, that we get legislative intent, and that's the reason why I'm asking you to, to yield. Are you going to give us any kind of assurance that in your interpretation or your desire, that if vehicle miles travel and greenhouse gases can't be mitigated to the level that's put forth in your bill, but there's a safety issue, that we can still move forward with that project? Because my understanding is if we can't mitigate all of the requirements within the greenhouse gases and vehicle miles traveled, we can't do the project. And so my question to you is, if we can't do that mitigation, and you said we should be able to, but if it can't, then, but there's a safety issue, can we still go ahead with that project according to your interpretation of the bill that you put forward? Representative Kraft. 
Madam Speaker, Representative Petersburg, I'm always willing to take your questions. Um, so uh, you ask a very hypothetical question. I will say that those, that same question can be asked of wetlands mitigation, and we've been able to move forward very successfully with that and addressing safety. Um, so the, uh, what I would say is, is that if there is a urgent safety need on the system, it will be dealt with. This will not stop that from being dealt with. There are many ways that MnDOT has to deal with urgent safety needs. Just a couple years ago in Olmstead County, there was an urgent issue where there was a crossover that people were crossing over and causing accidents, and someone passed away as a result of this. What they did immediately, right, was to go and put concrete barriers up to close off and make and improve safety immediately. When there is an immediate safety need, MnDOT has the tools, and this will not prevent them from handling it. Representative Petersburg. Um, thank you for that, and I, and I think that's something that needs to be on the record because we oftentimes talk about mitigation and the need for it in a kind of a vacuum in which the entire state is all underneath the same needs and the same issues that are dealing with it. Um, and obviously we know that um, metropolitan area and greater Minnesota uh, are just different. Uh, it's not that the one is better than the other or one needs to have more importance than the other, but if we had had the greenhouse gas emissions program that you talked about, I don't think we would have been able to have mitigated that if we wanted to finish Highway 14 because there just isn't enough stuff going on there in order to be able to do that. And yet that's a big safety concern. And so I think you're saying, well, if safety then may trump uh, if we can't do the mitigation. Uh, and with that, I think that's something that we need to at least have on the record, which, which you have done. So I appreciate that, and I will still request a green vote. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The chief clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 63 yeas and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Niska moves to amend House Law number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A34. I recognize the... <clears throat> I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, the A34 amendment is aimed at um, some efforts in the bill to regulate interstate rail travel, interstate freight rail. And I certainly understand the concerns that drive this uh, railroad regulation. For example, one of them is an effort to regulate train length. Um, and I can understand the, the concern, at least intuitively, about potential uh, safety issues with uh, longer trains and potential impacts that that might have in, in local areas. And, and Representative Brand and I have, uh, have had this discussion in committee, and I had a really good discussion with one of the advocates uh, for this. The concern I have is, uh, in addition to, to, to the lack of data about whether, what the right uh, solution is, um, we're just not the right entity to do it. And, and you all should have gotten a, a handout um, that says the Biden administration agrees railroad regulation belongs at the federal level. And I think we all understand we're talking about interstate commerce. We're talking about freight trains that travel across state lines. When you're thinking about especially um, train length issues, 
You're talking about a, a train coming from North Dakota, which doesn't have the same regulations. A whole entire train has to be rearranged, potentially, if Minnesota has a different rule. And the um, Supreme Court, actually, in the 1940s, looked at a state law trying to regulate train length and struck it down as unconstitutional. The Eighth Circuit had considered a, a Minnesota regulation in the uh, 19, uh, late 1980s that also tried to regulate train length and struck it down as unconstitutional. Other states have tried to regulate things like length of time in a train crossing, and those have been found to be preempted by federal law and therefore unconstitutional. When the state of Ohio tried to appeal that to the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Solicitor General's, uh, the, the Solicitor General, a uh, 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 Biden administration appointee, um, a Biden administration appointee argued that that was unconstitutional and the U.S. Supreme Court did not review it. So instead of just charging ahead with potentially uh, preempted unconstitutional laws, like what we did a, lot, uh, a few too many times last year, what my amendment does is ask the commissioner to do an independent legal analysis and to do a certif uh, certification of validity of these regulations before we go ahead and make them effective. And so, members, I think that this is a better way, better approach to deal with this issue, and I ask for your support. I recognize, oh, well, actually, there is an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. Brand moves to amend the NISCA amendment to House Bill number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A93. I recognize the member of the, uh, the member um, from Nicolette, Representative Brand. The noise is a little bit distracting. My apologies. Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Chair. Looks like we're all on Almanac at the Capitol tonight. Um, my amendment uh, would just basically uh, would accept the, uh, under the amendment, but what it would do is actually take away the effective date um, because, well, first of all, in the underlying amendment, we're asking a, um, we're asking a department or a commissioner to do something with no added money and also by August 1st, and that might be a tight timeline. So I would ask the body to support the, uh, the 893 amendment. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Yes, Representative oh, Niska. Thank you. thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, Representative Brand, if you will yield, I have a question. He will yield to a question. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Brand, if I understand the amendment to the amendment correctly, it, uh, it's deleting the provisions, the portions in which, the, um, in which we would postpone the effectiveness of these, or the, the, the legal effect of the uh, federal, or these new regulations until after the commissioner has made a determination on yay or nay on this legal analysis. Is that correct? Representative Brand. I'm sorry, I can hardly hear you with uh, the, what's going on upstairs. Could you repeat uh, really that? Perhaps a little louder. I can't. Representative Niska. Thank you. Uh, I, I understand. It's, I, I'm having a hard time hearing myself over here. Um, so the, the, if I'm understanding this correctly, the way this the amendment works is it would delete the provisions, for example, in 1.3 to 1.5 that says that the section is only is effective following the certification of validity submitted under under paragraph B, which means the these regulations would become effective whether or not the commissioner determines them to be valid under the commissioner's independent legal analysis. Am I understanding your amendment correctly? Representative Brand. Madam Chair, Representative Niska, that is also correct. Representative Niska. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, appreciate that um, clarification, Representative Brand. I think that's the, the, the real problem with this amendment to the amendment. Um, and so I, I'll have a few more comments, but Madam Speaker, I'd request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Ma Ma Madam, Madam Speaker. Representative I, Niska. Th thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wasn't quite finished. So. Um, the, the issue then, then becomes, and I appreciate at least that we would be able to go this far and, and have the commissioner to make this, uh, to still have, have the commissioner make this legal analysis. The problem is that when the commissioner makes this legal analysis, I think if they do a, a good faith, fair job and look at the, the case law, especially as it relates to the train length regulation, the commissioner is going to need to determine that the uh, law likely is preempted by federal law. 
However, it, the amendment to the amendment would require us to still, as a state, charge ahead with a, an unconstitutional preempted law, an area where we are trying to regulate in an exclusive area of, of federal jurisdiction. The federal statutes are very clear on this. I think the case law is actually quite clear on this. We had a really robust discussion on this in the Judiciary Committee about looking at the actual federal statutes that give exclusive jurisdiction with some very limited exceptions that I don't think apply in this circumstance. You have to be dealing with a local, a, a real local area issue of concern, and you have to be doing something that's not interfering unduly with interstate commerce. I think that especially the train length regulation would be doing that. And so what happens, what we would be doing is we'd be just charging ahead into an area where I think the state of Minnesota would be in a lot of legal peril. We've done this over and over and over again last year. We, we've seen this show before. We have three, federal, three state laws that we passed last biennium that are already enjoined by federal, federal judges in the District of Minnesota as being contrary to Minnesota law. And what that is going to result in is a situation where the commissioner of uh, transportation is going to look at this law, is going to realize it's unconstitutional, but is going to have to still go ahead and forward and defend it in court. And what that means is the railroads will sue the state of Minnesota. They will win because it's a, a violation of their rights under federal law. They're going to have the right to get attorney's fees again from the state treasury, just like the pharmaceutical company uh, industry, uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry is going to get, likely get um, their attorney's fees paid for when we're talking about the drug price controls that we passed last year, just like the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce is likely to get their uh, attorney's fees paid for by, uh, as a result of the election uh, speech regulation that we passed last year, just like Crown and Northwestern are likely to get their legal fees paid for as a result of the PSEO law that we passed last year. So I think uh, the better option would be to, to reject the brand amendment and to stick with the underlying amendment, which would postpone the effect of this until the Commissioner of Transportation has determined that it actually would satisfy uh, federal judicial scrutiny. So I urge members to vote no on the um, uh, amendment to the amendment. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, Representative Brand. Oh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I wanted to su support uh, Representative Niska's uh, request not to pass this because I think there's, there's two issues with the amendment to the amendment. One is the difference between um, certify and notify. And give you a comparison. How many have been watching TV and seen a commercial about 4imprint, the company that actually makes personal uh, products with people's name on, right? And they always, uh, at the end, said, are you 4imprint sure? Because they're so accurate with what they're doing. The difference here is between certify and notify is that certify says you've actually done the due diligence to make sure that what information you're giving out is there. Notify just says, well, I think so. This is what I what I think. That's a big difference. The other difference is is that you are eliminating when the notification or the understanding or the certification that we are in preemption issue where we aren't sure what's going on and maybe even that we're going to be preempted, it takes away the opportunity for us to stop that before we have to go in. I don't know how many of you know that Minnesota has not done very well on the preemption court cases. I think the last one was about uh, whether or not trains had to have a caboose. And uh, the Supreme Court says uh, that was a federal preemption and that we did not have the ability to determine that. So before we spend lots of dollars and so forth, uh, we should probably make sure that we are on, on proper footing and we should defeat this amendment and approve the original NISCA uh, amendment. Thank you. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Chair. Vote green. The clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol I. Carol I. Howard. Go. Howard I. Howard I. Cagle. Go ahead. Cagle I. Cagle I. Tabke. 
Tab key aye. Tab key aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 yeas and 62 nays, the motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Back to the underlying amendment, Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I'm disappointed. I think that that uh, significantly weakens this amendment, but I still think that this is an important issue, um, an important thing to acknowledge in, in, this, uh, in this law, that, that we do have some concerns about this and that the commissioner uh, does need to make sure that we, um, that we uh, look at federal law and, and, and make sure that these things aren't preempted. And so I urge member support. Thank you. Further discussion to the amendment? Representative Niska, remind me if you had asked for a roll call vote for this one. No. There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment as amended, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment as amended is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Murphy moves to amend House Bill number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A40. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Ottertail, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is an amendment that has to deal with rail and agriculture. Uh, requires the Commissioner of Agriculture to certify the costs and impacts of uh, these policies before they're implemented. Um, it's agriculture is significant in Minnesota. It's the heart of our economy. Agriculture is the fourth largest user of rail in the United States. Exporters, the uh, U.S. Is the, is the top grain exporter in the world, the United States is. One third of all exports move by rail and Minnesota is the fourth largest exporter in America. 25% of all grain is transported by rail. Wealth comes from the ground, and the rest of us just shuffle paper. This is really important, uh, so uh, we need to give a great consideration. And I would like to roll call on this amendment, please. A roll call being requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. There's an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. <clears throat> Brand moves to amend the Murphy Amendment to House Bill number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A94. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, the member from Nicolette, Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This one is very, uh, very much the same as the last one in that we're asking a commissioner and a department to do something by August 1st of 2024 without any additional funding for them to do that. And so um, and then also we are also um, deleting some of the things that similar in the last uh, amendment. And so I would ask for a green vote. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, we're looking for accountability and transparency. And we also know this is a significant uh, issue for Minnesota, uh, our agriculture. We want to make sure that we have a responsive response to it. We need to get that from the Commissioner of Agriculture. Um, the notification is important. Uh, Representative Petersburg talked about the due diligence and the ability to stop a project if it's wrong. And if you're looking at notification, uh, what if it comes shortly after all this is done? So it's really important for us to use, especially in this, in this part of our economy and agriculture, is to make sure you use all our resources, and the Commissioner of Agriculture would be the closest person to that. So for him to certify it would be good. I recommend that we have a roll call on this, and I would also um, you know, like, like to have a no vote. Thank you. A roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. I recognize the member from Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Th thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I would reiterate what I said before. Uh, the due diligence is really important for our commissioners who are going to make these decisions. And, and you're saying that they need to at least look at it, but without really telling them what parameters they need to actually make their recommendation. 
uh, based upon. And notifying um, is a lot different than certifying. There, you can't say it's the same thing, and yet we're taking away what they know is going to be a negative impact onto their, their industry, uh, and they can't say anything about it because they can notify, hey, we're in preemption issue, but it's going to still move forward. That's not very productive, and it's really putting our commissioners in a negative status. So please um, vote no on this particular amendment and uh, aye on the original amendment. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, just as we were talking today, I, I don't want to diminish any concerns we might have, and, and we, I don't want to minimize the issues of, of agriculture. Agriculture is the number one industry in our entire state. Um, we, uh, we have built the foundations of our state from our agricultural base over the many, many decades and centuries of success and prosperity. What I would suggest, though, is that we do need to do our due diligence but we can't force a commissioner to do that in a very tight time window with no money. Um, so something has to give, and I think the tight time window is one of those ways to do it. And, and furthermore, I think that we had a very good discussion in our committees. We talked about this in Judiciary Committee. We also talked about this in the Transportation Committee. And you know, last year, we all voted on a piece of legislation um, that actually created two people in the locomotive, in the lead locomotive. And, you know, we passed that legislation. There were no lawsuits. Nothing happened. Oh, by the way, it's also the federal law of the land because the Commissioner of Transportation at the federal level deemed it so. And so I think that one of those things that we can do is we can lead where we can when it comes to things like rail safety, where it comes to worker safety, where it comes to community safety. And I really do think this is another opportunity for us to do that. But I also want to acknowledge, again, and not diminish, the impacts on potentially with agriculture and impacts uh, also as well with, with uh, what preemption might take. So um, I would ask for a green vote on this today. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. <clears throat> Carol, aye. <clears throat> Carol, aye. Howard. Howard, votes aye. Howard, aye. Cagle. Cagle, aye. Cagle, aye. Tabkey. Tabkey, aye. Tabkey, aye. <clears throat> The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 yeas and 62 nays, the amendment, the motion does prevail and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. To the underlying amendment, I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm shocked. I heard due diligence. Well, if the committee did due diligence, they wouldn't have eviscerated the previous one. They would have realized over a century of history dictated federal courts and federal law and regulations override the states when it comes to the railways. And again, on this one, I, I'm shocked if the committee didn't realize that during certain times of the year, there are special regulations for agriculture to, during planting and harvest to be able to get that done. We have a history of caring about agriculture enough to realize that there are some special cases that you have to do. And if the committee did due diligence, they would not have to even have these amendments because they would have, one, not had the problem on the previous amendment, and on this amendment would have realized 
what should be done, what has been done, and not turn their back on caring about agriculture. I'm just shocked. The due diligence, oh, it's going to take time. Well, if the committee actually did their job, we wouldn't have to have the certification or notification by agency people. So I'm really disappointed at the lack of due diligence in this bill. Further discussion? To the member from Nicollet, Representative Brand. Thank you very much, ma Madam Chair. Um, on this uh, question of due diligence and that sort of thing, I would say that if, uh, if anybody had done their due diligence, they'd realize that the average grain train is about 110 cars, which is less than the 8,500 feet that we are requesting a train length to be in the state of Minnesota. Now, right now, we have trains that go up to three miles long, and they carry lots of different things at once. And I will say that those, those things have um, become untenable. They block intersections in my district. Uh, we've got uh, trains that will actually block people's capacity to get emergency medical services if needed. They block capacity for people to get to their kids' uh, school events, uh, after school activities. These three mile long trains pose a risk to both the community and the people that operate these trains every day. And I really have to ask that if we are doing our due diligence, we would do some research about what this actually would do. Um, I really do believe that we are not putting our backs or turning our backs on agriculture or taconite industry or any of the other industries in the state of Minnesota. What I think that all of us in the state, uh, as state representatives need to realize is that we have the right, and I will, I will um, read something that I passed out in the Judiciary Committee to give you a little bit more of a clear understanding. This guy's name is Lawrence Mann. He has an um, affidavit, sworn affidavit in the, in the state of Florida. And he said, so Lawrence Mann back up a little bit. In 1970, he actually wrote the 1970 Federal Rail Safety Act. So that's passed by Congress. I know it's, uh, uh, we are talking about a century of history and that sort of thing. In 1945, there was a Supreme Court thing in Arizona but the law of the land is what Congress passes unless the Supreme Court says otherwise. In the 1970 Federal Railroad Safety Act, it says specifically, a state may adopt or continue in force an additional or more stringent law, regulation, or order related to railroad safety or security when that law, regulation, or order, A, is necessary to eliminate or reduce an essentially local safety or security hazard. B, is not incompatible with a law, regulation, or an order of the U.S. government. And C, does not unreasonably burden interstate commerce. And it says here, the, the proposed legislation that we have, and also in another state in Colorado, which is identical legislation as well, is not a local safety hazard provision. Rather, it is statewide. Therefore, clearly undue burden or interstate commerce is not relevant in the present safety bill. And so we've got somebody that actually was the person who wrote the, test, uh, wrote the bill in 1970 that Congress passed and is the law of land that says we as states have the ability to do this. Now, I do think that we have a chance and an opportunity to lead on this, but it doesn't mean we're going to be an island to themselves. We very well might spur something to have happen at the federal level, and I'm okay with that. So I would ask that we vote for the overlying amendment as amended, and we move on to the next one. Further discussion to the amendment. Representative Murphy. You know, since I've, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, since I've been here, we've done nothing but give more power to our agency commissioners. Nothing, everywhere along the way. It's uh, forget about everyone else, forget about the elected, make sure we give it to the agencies. Well, this time, uh, in agriculture, it's really important because they're the only ones that understand, really understand what we're about. The seasonal differences that we need when we, when we start shipping our fertilizer and shipping our grain around. We need that accountability, we need that transparency, see, and we need it now. And so that's why it's so important for the Commissioner of Agriculture to have a significant part in this. We talk about train lengths in my, my town, in Perm, there's 40 trains that go by there a day. 40 trains. There's nine intersections that they cross. If we shorten up the trains, we're not going to make it any safer in Perm. 
because that train goes through there at 60 miles an hour, and we're going to get 20% more trains going through Purim. The Commissioner of Agriculture needs to make sure that agriculture products travel right. That's what this, that's what this uh, amendment's for. It's for making sure that agriculture stays on track and we don't get lost. That's what it's for. You need to green, vote green on this amendment because agriculture is the heart of Minnesota economy. Thank you. And Can I request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, aye. Carol, aye. Howard. Howard, aye. Howard, aye. Cagle. Cagle, aye. Cagle, aye. Tabkey. Tabkey, aye. Tabkey, aye. The Clerk will close the roll. There being 130 yeas and zero nays, the motion prevails and the amendment as amended is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> the clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Hanella moves to amend House Law number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A41. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Dakota, Representative Hadella. Madam Speaker, members, before I explain my very simple amendment, I want to make sure we all understand what I'm going to fix. So in the omnibus bill, there's House File 3499. This bill dramatically restricts the length of trains that are allowed to operate in our state. Currently, as Representative Brand explained, we have trains out there that are up to 15,000 uh, feet long. This bill is cutting that almost in half, almost in half, reducing it down to 8,500 feet. Now what that bill doesn't do is it doesn't help our farmers move their agricultural products to market. It doesn't help our miners on the iron range move their taconite to market. It doesn't help our already struggling, unaffordable economy if we're taking all these goods and saying we're gonna, we're gonna have to take longer to ship them to market. The other thing, and we've heard about this extensively tonight, that this bill does not do, is help our environment. If we're cutting the length of trains in half, We'll just do a simple exercise. We'll just say, well, if we have X amount of goods that we have to move around our state and we're gonna cut the length of trains in half, you could logically say it's gonna take about twice as many trains to move those. You know what that equates to? Twice as many greenhouse gases. We just heard we must, we must, we must, we must reduce our greenhouse gases. But here we are with this bill saying, well, maybe not in this case. We're gonna say that in this case, it's okay. So what my amendment does is my amendment exempts trains originating from Minnesota that are carrying Minnesota commodities, agricultural products, our valuable taconite, timber, other commodities, it exempts them from this 8,500 foot long new rule uh, in the underlying bill. It also helps our economy. We are not gonna risk all of a sudden, we just heard from uh, a representative about how critical these agricultural products are to our economy in Minnesota. 
we're coming out of uh, a post-COVID time when we had supply chain issues, and all of a sudden we're talking about making it harder to get these products to market. We don't want to do that. We're also going to help the environment. The fuel difference that this bill will create, or that my amendment will save, is the equivalent. Find the number again the equivalent of 640 Olympic-sized swimming pools of diesel fuel. I'm kind of a visual guy, so I was sitting here going, well, how many Olympic pools can fit in this chamber? So my best guess, and, and we could do a contest, my best guess was eight. If we put side by side, probably four high, high ceiling, eight Olympic pools in this chamber. So my amendment is going to save 80 of these chambers of diesel fuel from going into our environment that we must address. Sorry, Dean. I promise not to catch you. It's fine. That 840 uh, swimming pools of diesel fuel is the equivalent to 1 million cars on our roads. We must, we must, we must, we must take action. Right? These are all facts. It, this bill just does not make sense. It doesn't. It's going to hurt our economy. It's going to be bad for farmers. It's going to be bad for miners. It's going to be bad for our environment. Madam Speaker, I ask for a roll call on this and encourage and A roll vote. call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. There's an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. <clears throat> Liz Lagarde moves to amend the Hedella amendment to House file number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A95. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, the member from St. Louis, Representative Liz Lagarde. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And this amendment um, narrows it uh, to exempt only trains carrying taconite originating from uh, Minnesota. Um, I did check with um, industry where I'm from, and uh, the trains do not go uh, 8,500 uh, mm -hmm. feet um, to Representative Brand's point, but um, they may sometime, so um, I want to give them the option. So that's what this amendment is. Thank you. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Representative Hodella. Uh, Madam Speaker. Representative uh, Liz Lagarde, I really appreciate you bringing this amendment. I really do. I really appreciate you validating the damage that the underlying bill will do to groups that are trying to transport commodities around Minnesota. The only flaw in your amendment to my amendment is that you aborted the farmers. And it's crazy. I, I don't know if, if this side realizes it, it's in your team name. It's not the Democratic Fraud and Labor Party. It's the Democratic Farm and Labor Party. And while I appreciate the amendment to help our miners up there, it's going to be very interesting for me to see how your teammates vote uh, from communities like St. Peter, Moorhead, St. Cloud, Mankato, Rochester, and Northfield that have a very thriving farm community in their districts. Because this amendment to my amendment says, hey, we get it, you're right, eh, we see the impact, this is gonna be tough, we're not gonna talk about the environment on this one, but we recognize that this is gonna hurt, but we're just gonna take care of the miners. So Madam Speaker, I request a roll call on the amendment to the amendment, and to be honest, uh, it, a roll you know, call we'll, has we'll been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Hadella. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To be honest, uh, obviously we're going to encourage a red side on here, but it's going to be really interesting again just to see how your teammates vote on this that represent farm communities because it's, uh, it's, it's not a good amendment. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. The member from Martin, Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
So originally, I looked at this amendment to the amendment, and I thought that it was minorly offen it was an offensive amendment, because we have about 430,000 Minnesotans who are heavily invested in the agriculture industry. From start to finish, 430,000 Minnesotans derive their livelihood and support their families through one of the greatest industries in the state of Minnesota. Now, where I come from, we probably don't even have very many gravel pits, let alone iron mines. But I cannot imagine crafting an amendment that would attack northern Minnesota mining. I cannot imagine doing that because it is a wonderful, wonderful industry that we have been blessed to have in this state. So even though we have a hard time finding gravel in my district, I would never imagine trying to punch the mining industry in the face like we have just seen through this amendment to the amendment. But so first I thought this was offensive, but now I realize that this amendment to the amendment is actually incompetent. And the reason why is because our industry, the agricultural industry, has invested massive sums of money to develop the port of Duluth as an exit, an export route for commodities. The Soybean Growers Association is now looking at opportunities to export more than, like, we're talking 20,000 ton barges full of Minnesota soybeans to go to Europe through the port of Duluth via the railroad. We're talking big trains from my neck of the woods, which we don't have very many trees, but it is partly a neck of the woods. We're talking about soybeans moving via train to the port of Duluth, filling barges and going to places like Europe, which if you've ever seen a map, it's so much more efficient to send a barge from Duluth through the St. Lawrence Seaway and to Europe, as opposed to sending it down the Mississippi, around the Gulf of Mexico, and up to Europe. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to send our commodities that we produce a vast sum of in southern Minnesota and western Minnesota, and even in northern Minnesota. There's agriculture everywhere. This amendment to the amendment is a slap in the face to anyone who even imagines supporting Minnesota. This is a blatant attack on agriculture. It's actually almost impressive because we could have just created an amendment that guts it or changes it or makes it ineffective, but we made it incompetent. I am looking forward to see how this board lights up because I have to believe in my heart that we care about farming. Not only do the Republicans over here care about farmers and care about agriculture and care about a massive industry, but I imagine that the Democratic Farmer Labor Party also believes very strongly in agriculture here in the state of Minnesota. I am so looking forward to an entirely red board proving today that the F is not lost in the DFL. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Representative Lislagard. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I would encourage uh, both sides to vote green. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Carol. Carol, I. Carol, I. Howard. Howard, I. Howard, I. Cagle. Go ahead. Cagle, I. Cagle, I. Tabkey. Tabkey, I. Tabkey, I. 
The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 yeas and 60 nays, the motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. To the underlying amendment, Representative Hadella. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, it's, it's disappointing to see where our farmers place in the Minnesota House of Representatives. It really is. Now, I've got a couple more quick things to say, but I, I am going to, even though my amendment was gutted, I do see value in, in helping our miners and, and creating this exemption for taconite, and I'm gonna uh, recommend a green vote at the end of it. Um, but the funny thing for me is not only to see where our farmers place in the Minnesota House of Representatives but it's just some of the hypocrisy that I've seen in my time up here. One of them we talked about, we've been preached to tonight extensively about the environment. We must, we must, we must, we must fight climate change. And here we have a bill that's creating the equivalency of a million cars worth of greenhouse gases into our environment, I thought we had to do it for our kids and our grandkids. But not this time, folks. So it just, it really left me searching for why. And then it kind of dawned on me that if we have twice as many trains, we also have twice as many union railroad jobs. And I'll leave it with that. Any further discussion on the A41 as amended? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. <laughs> Members, please vote. Will the clerk please call the names of the members voting remotely? Carol. There you go. Carol I. Carol I. Howard. Go. Howard I. Howard I. Cagle. Cagle I. Cagle I. Tabkey. Tabkey I. Tabkey I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 128 ayes and one nay, the motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Peterberg moves to amend House Bill number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A52. The member from Wasika represented Petersburg to the A52 amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and we're, bear with us, we're just about done with the transportation portion of this bill. And, and I believe this is the last bill that will actually talk about the overreach and the mandates uh, to, to the railroad industry. We may talk about trains and a couple others, but this is the last one in regards to this. And, and here's what my amendment does is it actually pretty much takes away all of the mandates on railroad industry into this bill and takes it away for quite a few different reasons. One is I still am concerned about the fact that we are dealing with some potential legal issues into the future that we really don't have an understanding about. You gotta understand that uh, most of us on transportation committee and so forth uh, don't really have a background in railroad or engineers. So we get information from both the railroad companies as well as the, the unions. And, and sometimes 
uh, we put more stock in one versus, versus the other. But one of the things that I found interesting was in discussions about how it was necessary for us to control the hours of yard masters, uh, even though uh, we allow every other industry to allow overtime and others, that we needed to do that for safety. Yet we're hearing from yard masters themselves, the actual employees, hey, no, we're, we're used to the overtime, we enjoy it. Um, it, it allows us to have additional income for our families. Uh, we should make it at least elective uh, rather than, than mandating it. And that's, that's one part of it. Uh, the other is, is so many of the other uh, pieces in which we are trying to control uh, the, the industry that is just trying to stay in business uh, for ourselves. You know, I, I think Representative Hodella talked about it the best. Maybe we really should have included also uh, train uh, lengths and other things in our decisions on how we mitigate uh, these greenhouse gases for, for other projects. I see you smiling over there. I appreciate that. Uh, because it, it does have an impact. Whenever we have more uh, carbon fuels burned, uh, it doesn't matter in which form it is, uh, we are producing more greenhouse gases. I understand that this bill is, is not going to be there, but I think Representative Niska probably talked about it the best. Uh, the legal issue about response and about preemption is there. I think um, Representative Brand talked about uh, this, this program uh, that was created back in, or, or um, rules and regulations in regards to the Safety Act, done back in 1970. You know how many years ago that was? I graduated in 1970, so I know it's 54 years ago. And you know what? Um, the Supreme Court and others have made a lot of decisions since then that have modified those particular rules. And when we don't consider that fact, uh, we are just creating a blind following of something that's outdated. Uh, it's it's kind of like reading a history book uh, from 1970 and say, well, that's all the history we need to know. Well, there's 54 years of history since then. And we haven't taken that into consideration. We haven't done our due diligence, uh, uh, and we still are going to allow ourselves to be led into uh, kind of innuendo and concerns about something that uh, may or may not be true because we really don't know. Uh, and so this is a, a situation where I think it would have been best for us to have left this portion out of the bill, uh, but I understand that it's not. And with, with that, I'm going to be withdrawing the amendment. I understand the climate of, of the majority on, in this particular area. But I want to put us all on record that we are leading ourselves into a dangerous situation that could have dire consequences in the future. So remember, uh, when that comes, um, who to look at, uh, not on this side of the aisle. So um, thank you for the, for the ability to talk about it, but I withdraw the amendment. Representative Petersburg withdraws the A52 <clears throat> amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Robbins moves to amend House Bill number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A43. The member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins, to the A43 amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I know um, that this is somewhat Ooh. of an unusual amendment for a transportation bill, but it does affect transportation and it is germane, so just bear with me for a couple minutes. As you all know, um, there's a health care crisis, and particularly um, for hospitals that have a really high percentage of uncompensated care. And in Hen Hennepin County, we have two hospitals that are our safety net hospitals. Hennepin County Medical Center, which is the county hospital, and North Memorial Robbinsdale, which is a nonprofit hospital, but it serves 74% of patients who get Medicare or Medicaid, and 80% of their patients come from Hennepin County. So they have a huge burden of uncompensated care that is really saving the county hospital both money and they just don't have room for all the patients that North Memorial sees. And they've been working in partnership. So um, two years ago, there was a contract between the county and North Memorial Robbinsdale to provide $24 million for each of two years to help offset the uncompensated care because they are losing so much money and it's really a financial crisis right now. 
But abruptly, in January of this year, Hennepin County pulled out of the contract, leaving a $24 million hole in the budget of North Memorial Robbinsdale, which is serving a huge proportion of the Medicare and Medicaid patients in our county. So there's a financial hole that needs to be filled, and I really don't think the state should be on the hook for it. I think the county should be looking for ways to find the money um, to deal with this. So given my concern about the wasted money on the Blue Line extension, I thought this would be a very good place to take the money that the state has put into Hennepin County for the Blue Line extension, $40 million. And we've talked at length earlier in the session about how that's wasteful, how it's not needed, how it's not the best mode of transportation for this quarter. We should be looking at a blue line, uh, I mean a bus rapid transit instead. So members, this is a way we can help the county help itself out of a very critical crisis. So um, what the amendment does is it directs the county to take the money from the, that the state has given for the blue line extension and instead direct it to North Memorial Robbinsdale. And, and the reason this is so important is not only because they need to fill the hole that they broke the contract on for $24 million, but we are leaving federal money on the table with how this is running. So there's a federal program called Directed Payments Program, DPP. And if we could find the local match we would be able to take down, draw down federal money to help sustain this hospital that's a safety net hospital critical to the county. The local partner was going to potentially be the county and then they broke up the contract and it didn't work, right? And so by the end of session, if we can find the local money, there's language moving in this other body that would create this partnership that would enable us to draw down the federal money. So time is of the essence. We have three weeks to get this right and be able to access these federal funds. So if we, for example, got the 24 million, that would mean that they would get 60 million total because it's the local money goes in 45%, the federal money comes in at 55%. So members, this is critical. And I know if you're not in Hennepin County, you think, why do I care? But it's because, A, these are, it's a critical safety net hospital, and we're encouraging the county to use money the state has given for the blue line extension that we've talked all the reasons why that's not a good idea, and instead put it towards this critical issue for health care for our um, most vulnerable citizens. So members, um, there's so much more I could say about this, but that's the gist of the amendment, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Agbaje. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, members, I would encourage a no vote on this amendment. Um, this is an appropriation for the blue line from a previous year on uh, transportation needs. The blue line and light rail is still very much a needed investment um, in the area where the line is currently looking at being scheduled to go. It's something that Hennepin County is currently still developing. There are multiple conversations happening every day about the blue line. Um, transit is also really important, especially for our metro area. We want Minnesota and the Twin Cities and the metro region to be a world-class destination. In order to do that, you need multiple transit options. Light rail should be in that mix. Um, and it is an investment, not only in people and jobs, but also cleaner transportation, which is what we've talked about here today on this transportation section of this larger bill. Um, I will say um, that federal money is also on the line for the blue line. Um, in order to be able to complete this project, we will need to show the federal government, which has, uh, is considering the final amount that they will give us, but it is going to be a significant amount of money to help secure the uh, production and the operation of the blue line. So I would again encourage members to vote no on this amendment. Further discussion? Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Agbaje. I appreciate your perspective on this. Members, I wasn't gonna go down um, my whole thoughts on the blue line extension, but I'll just quickly summarize. There's been a lot of money already sunk into this, and as we have seen with the Southwest Light Rail Project, which is 
millions, if not close to a billion over budget, 10 years past deadline, and it is still not operational, and they still have recently just discovered expensive new problems because the, the lines are too close together and they have to fix that now. We should not be spending another dime on extending the blue line until Southwest Light Rail is operational and fully staffed. Members, we do not have the staff right now to adequately staff for safety all of the lines that are operating. And Southwest Light Rail is not even up yet. So that we would think that we should just leave that $40 million we gave Hennepin County for the future blue line extension Instead of diverting it to help with a crisis in our safety net hospital now is hard for me to fathom. And as, as we've also discussed, there is not unanimity among the communities that would be served by the Blue Line extension. Many of them don't want their communities torn up and dealing with this. Many of them have specified that they would prefer the much more flexible bus rapid transit route. So the blue line is far from certain that it's even gonna happen, and that 40 million could be used now to help stem a crisis at one of our safety net hospitals. So members, I'm asking you to please consider this. This, this is not new money. This is just helping the county reprioritize for what is right in front of us, which is a crisis in our safety net hospitals. Please vote green. All those in favor of the A43 amendment, I meant to Representative ask for a Robbins call. would like a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Will the clerk please call the names of the members voting remotely? Uh, Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 64 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. West moves to amend House Law number 5242, the second of Grossman as amended. The amendment is coded A38. The member from Anoka, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The A38 amendment just changes the way the greenhouse gas assessments are paid. Because one thing that always sticks in my craw is using trunk highway funds for things other than trunk highways. So using it for this assessment really is not a proper use of trunk highway funds. People want roads built in their communities because, as I said earlier, there's $6.6 billion worth of needs in our state highway system. And since we have to find the money somewhere, we can't just take it. I think a great spot to take it from is the Minneapolis Duluth Northern Lights Express. And that project, you know, 190 some million dollars, it's exactly the kind of thing that gets funded when you have this massive surplus that we had, but you just can't bear the thought of returning any money to the taxpayers. So you blow $200 million on a train. So we'll just take a small portion of that to pay for another one of your priorities, the assessments. Because trunk highway funds are sacred. They're so sacred, they're in our Minnesota state constitution. And it is what our residents expect, that trunk highway funds should be used for trunk highways. So members, this is exactly what needs to be done with this excess money. 
and I'm sorry, I cannot take more <laughs> time. Uh, and Madam Speaker, I request a roll call. Representative West requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call discussion. The member from Hennepin, Representative Kraft. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, Representative West. Um, so the, uh, appreciate you trying to find some money for my, uh, my stuff, um, but I think where it's at is, is makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna recommend a no vote. Um, the tools, the, the money that this is um, being used for are tool development for analyzing impacts of projects on the trunk highway system. Um, even, and there's some funding here. Let's see, what are you, what are you doing here? Yeah, so it's, it's all for impacts of projects on the trunk highway system. It's legitimate use of trunk highway funds. Um, and so I'd recommend a no vote. Further discussion, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I understand how you could think that. It's a fair point, but I don't think it's what Minnesota residents expect. Design, maintenance, construction, engineering of trunk highways. An assessment for something that's not directly related to putting that beautiful, beautiful concrete into the ground with the beautiful four-lane highway leading us to where we want to go. It's what we should use our trunk highway funds for. So members, you know, maybe we could orally amend it to add more money for your greenhouse. Well, $200 million to greenhouse gas assessments, would that get you there? Well, you know, we do what we can here. So members, vote green on this wonderful amendment to lay some more beautiful concrete in all our communities so we can enjoy some roads to get us to where we need to go. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Will the clerk please call the names of the members voting remotely? Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 64 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Olson B moves to amend House Law number 5242. The second of Grossman has amended. The amendment is coded A39. The member from Martin, Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For the last uh, about year now, we've heard a lot of talk about how much funding we have provided. You know, we've found great massive amounts of funding for education, historic. We have historic funding for roads. We also have historic tax increases for transportation, but I won't mention that. Members, we have historic spending on transportation, that's all I heard, but we completely and utterly forgot our townships. Completely forgot them, just left them out of the cake. We said, actually, we didn't leave them out of the cake. We said, your cake comes after everyone else's cake. They get to eat their cake, and then you'll get the cake later. Whatever's left of it, you can have. Now, members, we, we baked a big cake to the tune of about $200 million for a railroad, a light rail, or actually, is it a light rail? It's a railroad, the Northern Lights Express, passenger rail project to Duluth. We threw $200 million there, and that cake is just sitting there. Currently, no one is slicing a piece of that cake. The money's there. The cake is there. It's been baked. It's ready to go, but no one's ready to eat the cake. The project is not currently going. So, a wonderful idea that we should do is we should take a part of that cake that's just sitting there, and we should give it to the towns, give it to the townships, give it to the, or the bridge fund, the town bridge fund. 
let them eat the cake along with everyone else that's currently eating cake. And then we can, you know, talk about this express at a later date. This is what we should be doing. We should not forget about an entire group of people. We should not forget about one of the largest amounts of roads in this state. And we have. We said, don't worry about it. Fix your gravel roads on your own. Fix your roads, fix your bridges on your own dime. Maybe something will come later. Members, this is the right thing to do. We've had a long history in the Transportation Committee of funding all aspects of transportation. That includes transit. That's included our airports. That's included rail. And here we are leaving out an incredibly important aspect of transportation. So today is your opportunity to rectify that situation. Let's send $8 million to the townships for their roads and their bridges. I would recommend, or I would ask for a roll call, Madam Speaker. Representative Olson requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative thank, Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And with that, I'll leave you with the opportunity to do the right thing to give a portion of this cake that you were all so, you know, con the, the conversation's been there, historic spending, give some of that historic spending to the ones who've been left out. And just take it from the ones who don't even need it yet. Because we can talk about that later. Thank you. Discussion to the 839 amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you, Representative Wilson, and thank you for your contributions to the committee. I uh, really have appreciated your presence uh, here this last um, couple of years. Um, I will ask for a no vote. Um, we were... All of those cake analogies, really, I mean, who else is hungry? <laughs> he made everybody else even more hungry. Um, but last year we gave $7 million in, in general fund uh, to towns and town roads, and then between some of the other um, uh, air, you know, revenue that we put into the bill last year, that totaled $21 million. And through our new transportation advancement account, that money for towns and town roads will also increase uh, significantly over the next uh, few years. So while I appreciate your, your sentiment, um, I still would ask for a no vote. Further discussion, Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The, the concept that the funding will come later is a good one. We need to fund our townships, we need to fund our bridges, but also the fact of the matter is that they need it immediately. And this is a really good, well-crafted uh, way to make this happen because not only can we fund what we need to today, but we can also discuss funding what we may in fact need to or maybe not need to do tomorrow. This seems to me like an absolutely perfect opportunity for us to have our cake and eat it too. Members, please vote green on this amendment. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Will the clerk please call the names of the members voting remotely? Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and 66 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. 
<coughs> Fogelman moves to amend House Line Number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A51. The member from Nobles, Representative Fogelman. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, Representative Olson wasn't successful in getting any of the train money redirected. This, this amendment would take $194.7 million that would fund the Duluth train that is just sitting there that apparently the federal government didn't think was worth funding either because they did not match those funds. They, tr they, I want to transfer that to two different things. $150 million to the corridors of commerce. These projects help improve safety, which I know is important to everybody in this chamber. And for instance, this amount would fund the 494 Easy Pass expansion in Representative Coulter's district, allowing one more needed project to help things run smoother on our existing roads. I think that's a little bit more important than a train that is probably not even ever going to get finished. We put a lot of money into, a lot of taxpayer money into corridors of commerce, and there are still over $1 billion of projects in there that need funding. Projects more important than money again for a train that's probably never going to get finished. Another amount, $44.7 million, that would be used for railroad crossings to help them get the safety upgraded, it upgrades they need. So, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask for a roll call. Representative Fogelman requests a roll call, saying 15 hands there will be a roll call. Representative Fogelman. So let's put this money to better use instead of just sitting there, not being used, not doing anything, any good for anybody. Let's put money into our roads. That's what our transportation monies should be used for. Please vote green. The clerk will take, oh, discussion. Sorry, I thought we were on the second round. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, uh, thank you, Representative Fogelman, and thank you for your contributions in the committee. Um, you know, you, have a, you had a very good scouting report on me because you know that uh, rail grade crossings and corridors are very important to me, so this is a, this is a tough one. Um, but, uh, back, you know, back in 2013, we created uh, uh, the Corridors uh, program on a, a bipartisan basis, and, and uh, at that time, also, we were having, you know, a lot of discussion about rail safety, and so we created a, a grade crossing account as well. So, um, we gave $25 million in Corridors uh, in the last uh, funding bill last year, and uh, this is usually something, I think, almost every biennium since we created the program we've put money in uh, to corridors. So last year we did as well. And now we have a million and a half uh, coming every year uh, to the uh, railroad grade crossing account. So these are all, these are funded. Uh, we've put in money. I don't think it's mutually exclusive of uh, the um, uh, passenger rail project. And so uh, for that reason, I would ask for a no vote. Further discussion, the member from Douglas, Representative Franson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I too would rise in support of the Representative Fogelman amendment. Members, I'm looking at an article from Fox 9 from May 24, 2023. A passenger train running from Minneapolis to Duluth is on track becoming a reality after state lawmakers approved $195 million in state dollars this week. That unlocked federal grants that are expected to pay for the remaining 80% of the Northern Lights Express project. Members, I started laughing because the federal dollars that were released, I believe, were about $500,000. And um, I'm not exactly sure that is going to be enough to pay for the federal amount of 80%. So, I mean, I'm not very good at math, but I'm pretty sure that $500,000 is not 80% of $195 million. Members, this money is sitting there. It's been there now for a year, unused, and we have unmet needs in this state. 
for roads. So members, this is a fiscally responsible thing to do to support our lanes, not trains. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. I expect a yes vote on this. The member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Fogelman, I appreciate your amendment. Uh, if she hadn't already requested a roll call, I would request the roll call, Madam Speaker. She has. Representative okay, Kosnick. Good. Thank you. Um, you know, looking at this bill and uh, taking a little time away from the Transportation Committee, uh, I watched this bill with uh, some interest. And I appreciate Representative Fogelman's uh, hitting two very important points to the chair of the committee that's uh, served uh, very well but is retiring. And the rail grade crossings and the corridors of commerce programs are much better uses of tax dollars uh, than an expensive passenger train. But looking more broadly at the bill, what we're doing to the Railroad providers actually makes it less likely that you will use passenger train to the level that you want. The increased congestion, cost, and complexity that we're adding to the rail transit system, the rail transport system makes it almost impossible for railroads to accommodate passenger rail from an operational perspective. Railroads are in the business of moving freight, first and foremost, not necessarily people. And they will not take on passengers if there's a negative impact on their freight business and the freight that's carrying Minnesota's and the nation's economy. So this bill limits uh, the section, uh, the length of trains in section 47, as we discussed earlier. It also adds arbitrary wayside detector requirements in section 46, and that's gonna increase cost and unneeded operational complexities for our rail transport operators. And then third, the bill will establish, uh, will ch make changes to well-established collective bargaining agreements and processes and dictate staffing that is gonna impact both cost and the ability to accommodate passenger rail needs. And so these increased congestion, the increased cost, the increased complexity that this bill overall has on our rail exporters and carriers will make it almost impossible to even operate the North Star passenger rail that, as we've mentioned, is, ex excuse me, Northern Lights. Northern it's, yeah, North Star doesn't work so well either. It's not even gonna perform to North Star. We're not even gonna get this thing out of the gate because there's not gonna be the, the capacity on the rail lines. Shortening the, the train lengths is gonna create double demand on the capacity and timing, and there's not gonna be room for passenger rails on there. And so, Representative Fogelman, I, you adequately cited a, a good need of increasing our corridors of commerce that is supposed to help transport product and services and increase commerce throughout the state on our roads. Since we're messing up the rail, might as well get the truckers going. So I appreciate that part. And interestingly, the, the highway rail grade separations just a quick little, you can go uh, do this with me at home or, or at your desk right now. Just put in, your, in the Google Metro Transit Light Rail Accidents. You will see March 24th, Metro Transit reports two crashes invo involving light rail trains. March 18th, person hospitalized after a crash with the light rail train. November 23, pedestrian struck by light rail train in St. Paul. There's a couple videos if you want to watch. And not only are there ample news articles about the rail grade separation just for the light rail, but there's also law, surprise, law firms that are happy to take you on as a client if you've been injured 
by the trains, either a passenger or in your car. Um, and then November 23rd, a passenger, train passenger collision on Metro Green Line. And it goes on and on. Two injured after light rail train hits an SUV. And it just goes on. That's gonna increase when you shorten the trains. As Representative Murphy mentioned, you're just gonna increase the amount of trains crossings when you have a shorter train. It just doesn't even make sense from an operational standpoint as a civilian, but if you're trying to operate the logistics of managing Minnesota's economy and the freight to and from in and out of the states, you're gonna increase the number of trains because they, if you shorten them. At least if you have the standard lengths now, you know what you're dealing with. And so the real problem at grade crossings, I think is in our light rail trains, not our freight trains. And so there is a whole bunch, three, at least three provisions I outlined of why we should accept this amendment, keep Minnesota's economy moving, increase our corridors, our commerce, make our grade crossings safer, and utilize taxpayers' dollars more wisely. Thank you, members. I appreciate uh, the amendment and encourage a green vote. The member from Isanti, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, Representative Vogelman, thank you for this amendment. It's an important amendment. Our corridors of commerce is the main place where all our goods and services come to our stores. Everything comes by truck. It's all we get to the store. But what's more important is the fact that where the funds come from. At one time, I lived left less than 100 yards from the B line. What's the B line? That's where the Northern Lights Express is going to go. Right now, the B line is almost at full capacity with freight. At full capacity with, with the added lane, trains they're going to put on with the passenger, giving them priority, it's going to shut our freight down. It's going to shut our, our grain our, and other things getting to the port in Duluth. It's going to hurt this economy. Representative Hornstein, I understand you love trains. I actually rode on the trains in Duluth when it was actually operational. But Amtrak quit because they were going so far in debt on that line. It was not feasible. And it only ran once a day, once up, once down. But financially, it did not work. People were not using it. We have the North Star line. Guess what? It's not being used, and it's actually costing the taxpayers of Minnesota and those in the taxpayers in the metro area a lot of money. It's hurting us. We're bleeding from the cost of it. And the other thing about the Northern Lights Express is the safety factor. When that goes in, it's going to shut down the vast majority of our township road crossings. Right now, I have a bridge that, a township bridge that is closed because the railroad won't fix it because when they first redid it, it started on fire from the creosone and the engine going by. We got it out, we have it set, able to repair it so it could be used. But the people that live on that, just on the other side of the bridge, less than a third of a mile from State Highway 65, they have a two to two and a half mile detour because that bridge is closed to get to Highway 65. We had an opportunity to give the townships funding to help. But with the Northern Lights Express, it's going to shut down those crossings. And in emergency situations, if somebody's having a heart attack, minutes count. Literally minutes 
is the difference between life and death. We have that golden hour in an emergency to get somebody from the time it happens to the emergency room giving them life-saving services. When you start putting a two to three mile detour, that's a death sentence. That's what this Northern Lights Express is doing to my community. It can be a death sentence to somebody that has a medical emergency. Now, Representative Fogelman's amendment helps out with the Commerce of Corridor, which is actually going to help our economy, getting things to our store so we can buy them, buy the food, buy the clothes, buy the medications that we need. Members, please vote for the Fogelman Amendment. Representative Fogelman. Thank you, Madam Speaker, members. Thank you for all the discussion. Again, I just think that this two, almost $200 million just sitting there, not being used, is not what our taxpayer, taxpayers are wanting. Let's use this money in, in the corridors for commerce and our railroad safety. And before we take our green vote, I would just like to thank Chair Hornstein and Lead Petersburg for all your support and help over my first two years here and serving on the Transportation Committee. Members, please vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Will the clerk please call the names of the members voting remotely? Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard votes no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 64 ayes and 66 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. <clears throat> There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> West moves to amend House Law number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A42. The member from Anoka, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my amendment repeals the automatic increase in the gas tax that was passed last year. And really, we shouldn't be automatically raising taxes. That's not right. We should have the courage and nobility to actually take a vote when we decide to take more of people's money. It's, it's a very sneaky way to go about stealing. You know, you should do it the right way. Stand up and take a vote. You shouldn't make it automatic. You know, and there's a right way to do things. Say somebody has something that you think is yours. You don't break into their house at 4.45 in the morning and take, try and take it back. You go through the courts. Because to break into their house, that's first degree burglary. There is a right way to do things. And members, we should end this automatic inflator on the gas tax because it's an increase every single year. Just wait four to 10 years from now when you see, wow, how did gas get so expensive? Well, you can thank Democrats for that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Agbaje. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise to a point of order under uh, Rule 3.21. Please state your point of order. Uh, under Rule 3.21, uh, the chapter that this amendment covers chapter 297A is not in the bill and neither is the subject and so I would call I would ask you to rule this uh, out of order for Jermaine's. I've had the opportunity to review the amendment and to review the bill. 
the section of law that the amendment proposes to change is not in the bill, so I find the point of order well taken. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to appeal the ruling of the Speaker and request a roll call. Representative West appeals the ruling of the Speaker and requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative West, on your mainness, Madam to Speaker the body. Advice. Hey, this is literally the first time I've ever been point of order. That's how reasonable I am. And so you should understand, this is, we're talking about, you know, they said, oh, the subject is not in the bill. Well, the subject of transportation certainly is in the bill. And speaking of the bill, what? There's transportation, there's housing, there's a ridiculous amount of stuff packed in this bill. So to say it's not germane, it's like you look at half the stuff in this bill, of course it's germane. If this is germane, if this isn't germane, this whole bill shouldn't be allowed. It is completely, complete madness. Again, very sneaky way of doing business. That seems to be a trend of the DFL these days. They'd rather break into people's houses than do things the right way. So I urge members Point to of order, Madam Speaker. red again. Representative, uh, sorry. <laughs> We need more sleep. Representative Long. Uh, Madam Speaker, Masons 124, paragraph one, avoiding personalities, referring to a member of the DFL and saying that they are breaking into people's houses is clearly personalities. Representative, uh, Representative West, um, the, the, there's certainly troubles with that, but the, uh, the other... <laughs> The other issue I have is when you say sneaky, it's skating pretty close to motives. So if we could just stick to whether the uh, issue is in the bill or not. Further discussion on the appeal of the ruling of the speaker. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I'm gonna try to offer advice that's very brief and concise. The matter in front of us is that the gas tax increase with inflation is not in the bill, if, if I understood the Speaker's ruling, is that correct? That's correct. Well, Madam Speaker, I'd say that this is germane because when this transportation bill passed off the House floor last year, the gas tax and the increase was not in that bill either. Any further discussion on the appeal? A uh, red or a red vote would go against the ruling of the speaker. A green vote would uphold the ruling of the speaker. The clerk will take the roll on the appeal. Will the clerk please call the names of the members who are voting remotely? Carol. Carol, I. Carol, I. Howard. Howard, I. Howard, I. Cagle. Call the names of the members who are voting remotely. Hello. What? No. Hold on. Cagle. What did she do? Yep. All right, go ahead. Kegel. <laughs> Kegel, I. Kegel, I. Tabkey. Tabkey, I. Tabkey, I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 68 ayes and 61 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the decision of the Speaker shall stand. Before we embark upon the labor-related amendments, we will hear a little bit about the labor portion of the bill. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, the, the labor portion of this bill, um, we had a one, our $11.3 million target, that's what we ended up with, and that, that money's going towards the Hornstein portion of the bill, House File 4509, uh, 
broadband labor standards portion of the bill, House File 4659 for Representative Berg, the misclassification portion of the bill, which is House File 4444. I didn't stutter. Um, that's the Greenman portion of the bill. Um, there's OSHA rules in here from Representative Curran, House File 4713, which is about testing the lead of, in workers to make sure that they don't have, they're not over the limit of that. And then the Residential Energy, or energy Code portion of the bill, it's getting late. Um, House File 4242 from Representative Kraft. We also have in the bill um, House File, like I said, House File 4659 from Berg, uh, House File 4242 for, from Kraft, House File 4994, that's the prevailing wage section of the bill um, for funded the, or construction that's publicly funded from Representative Coulter. The bill we heard earlier today from Representative Stevenson, the kid influencer bill that's also in our bill, um, a bill that from mine that was in there, House File 3522, which changes allow the the change allows all employees the ability to look at their what's in their personnel records that are held by their employers and there's also a bill house file 5338 surprise surprise a republican bill from representative nash and that is allowing or getting a, uh, setting up a system for pool contractors to get registered which would then allow them by paying into the the contractor recovery fund when Situations like happened in a few years back with a contract that stiffed a whole lot of them, homeowners, allow them to recover some of their losses in the bill. And that's what's in the bill, Madam Speaker. And uh, again, we have the, we have amendments to the bill. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Nelson M. moves to amend House Law number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A82. Representative Nelson, to your amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker, members. And what this does is a, a, a portion I didn't mention when I walked to the bill. It deletes uh, the U of M Pelra language that was in the bill. And this is due to a fiscal note that arrived late. Um, interestingly enough, the U of, when, when we had this in committee, I foreshadowed that, you know, the, with the practice that happens when agencies don't like something that we put in a bill, something that's, a, or a bill that's coming forward, they'll put a huge fiscal note on it when, and I foreshadowed that, that this might end up being killed by fiscal note. Well, that's why we're taking it out. The, we got a huge fiscal note from the U of M and stating a bunch of things. Now I understand that the Senate is challenging the fiscal note, but as of right now, because of it is, we're taking it out. Interestingly enough, our portion that would, the labor bill would fund is zero. Um, the rest of the costs would go to higher ed for the U of M and for the state colleges. But again, because of the high fiscal note and uh, that they were going to, that they're using to fund people to, for union busting consultants like they've done in the past, for employees trying to exercise their rights to form a, to organize a union. But because of the high fiscal note, we're having to take this out. So I urge a green vote on the amendment. Any discussion? Representative Rarick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just really quick on this. So this is, again, another example of a bill that didn't come to higher ed. He just said that it had a fiscal cost in higher ed. This is pertaining to the University of Minnesota. The Senate did have a massive, huge hearing. We had nothing. It also didn't go to state gov. Um, so again, I'm glad this is coming out, but we really need to follow proper procedures and go to the right committees, and we would have found this out had it gone to higher ed. Um, it did not. So I ask you to support this because it shouldn't have been in in the first place. It didn't make the proper, didn't go the proper uh, procedure and it didn't go the proper committees. So thank you, Madam Speaker. All those in favor of the Nelson Amendment, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Folks, uh, we cannot have participation from folks in the gallery, or we will have to clear the galleries. So uh, I'm not sure if that's where the, perhaps it was the alcoves on the floor. Sorry if I'm impugning the galleries for no reason. 
Uh, it just sounded like it was from that direction, but uh, sorry. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Nelson M. moves to amend House Law number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A88. Might have been the back row. <laughs> uh, the member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson, to your amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And what the A8 amendment does, it's an amendment to the language in the broadband section of the bill. Um, there's been some working on this to tweak this language and get it right between a group, a couple of, or a, a group of uh, interested members or interested people that are that are pushing putting this language forward. This is a partial agreement. We don't have total peace in the valley yet, but this is what they've got for their language. And uh, I suggest a uh, yes vote on this amendment. There is an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schultz moves to amend the Nelson M. Amendment to House File Number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A97. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I need a moment to find the A97. Can somebody bring Representative Schultz a copy of the amendment to the amendment? <laughs> Madam Speaker, I didn't. I did not receive. There's a, copy a how many Republicans does it take joke in that? In the <laughs> <laughs> Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The uh, A97 here. Um, we're changing the bill here, and this is specifically. In no, in no case shall the workforce on a grant-funded project include an illegal or undocumented worker. If an illegal or undocumented worker is found to be working on the project without employment authorization, the employer, general contractor, or foreman on the project shall be subject to the misclassification fines and penalties subject under this bill. And uh, a very positive uh, vote for us to take in this body. The goal of misclassification uh, in, in the underlying conversation that's happening during the course of this session is all about ensuring that Minnesota workers benefit uh, from uh, the jobs here and that Minnesotans come first. And so it's critically important that we adopt this uh, amendment tonight. Thank you. Did you want to roll call, Representative Schultz? I was going to wait to hear if, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, if uh, what, what uh, Chair Nelson said. Got it. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chief Speaker and members. Um, what I've got from Deed and what I what I know from my current current or past employment, this amendment's not required because it's already current federal law and practice. Um, according to Deed, they already do, do this. They make sure that nobody. Let me read this here from the from the from the first. State funding, all the state contracts for broadband project that receive state funding require that recipients of those funds to comply with existing state and federal laws, including employing individuals that are only employing individuals that are authorized to work. Employees in this work, just like any other, are required to provide proof of work authorization, which means they have to fill out I-9 forms that everybody, when they are hired on a new job, going back to the Reagan administration, have to fill out. And so these contracts, we have guarantees that allow the state to monitor for compliance, and that with this, like other grants requirements, it requires the grantee to provide and maintain certified wage records for six years of this. So with this is not necessary because it's already done. So Madam Chair, Madam Speaker and members, I request a no vote on this amendment. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Chair Nelson. I do request a roll call at this time. Representative Schultz requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I appreciate what uh, Chair Nelson said, but really this gets to the heart, the very heart of worker misclassification. We're talking about tonight an entire conversation surrounding policies to ensure that we aren't favoring foreign workers ahead of Minnesota workers. That's the premise. That's our priority tonight. So 
This is a really simple, simple thing. I, frankly, I wish that we would have heard that this was going to be a friendly amendment. Uh, you might mention uh, what's in, in law at the federal level. We can only benefit as a state uh, from adopting this amendment to ensure that it's Minnesotans who benefit. If we're talking about worker misclassification and talking about the dollars that are going to be spent in broadband, Representative Nelson, we want to ensure that those dollars that $650 million or more that's going to be spent in broadband in our state here in the next few years, it should benefit Minnesota workers. And that's why a protection like this is not only perfectly in line, this is what we need. This is really what we need. There can be a federal standard, and that's great. I'm glad that the federal government has that standard. Now we need to make sure that we're protecting Minnesotans. And, and largely, this, this goes to the very topic that we have been debating in the Labor Committee this session. It's, it's this idea, this is an idea, this is something that has come from the labor and trade unions um, in and around the capital and throughout the state of Minnesota, really concerned that their jobs are being taken by people who didn't come to this state and this country legally, that they're jumping the line and that somehow that there's contractors and businesses um, that are bad actors. And so we only benefit as a state together when we adopt an amendment like this, uh, which is exactly why I would encourage support of this amendment and ask uh, for your uh, green vote. The member from Hennepin, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, uh, Representative Schultz. Um, we haven't gotten to my amendment yet, but one of the, the things that I find problematic about this amendment um, that we actually changed in, in our bill was people talked a lot about individual liability. Um, and this, uh, your amendment would have individual liability without a repeated or knowing standard. We actually add that um, in the amendment we're gonna adopt to the misclassification um, bill because we heard um, uh, from uh, um, um, uh, business groups, because we heard from ABC, Housing First, and others. Um, and so I'd say, we haven't gotten to that amendment yet, but we will, um, and we'll adopt it. And that is another reason I'd say members should vote no. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I think we've gotten a little bit off course with this conversation uh, because certainly there are federal standards regarding illegal and undocumented workers. I mean, any of us who have hired people have dealt with I-9s and collecting uh, documentation to ensure that someone can work in the United States legally. However, the uh, Schultz Amendment makes it very clear that um, employers are being treated the same and that the misclassification fines and penalties will apply equally when, when an employer is dealing with an illegal or, or undocumented worker. That is different than just status. That is saying these employers are going to be, be dealt with the same way. And, and to Representative Greenman's point, uh, it's, I'm glad that you're adding that amendment, but that amendment will apply here too. That amendment will apply here too. Because they'll be, they'll be subject to the same misclassification and fines and penalties under section 181.723. So I guess maybe if you're amending a different section of statute, we'll have to clean that up. But if not, it, it applies the same way. This is not the same as just dealing with illegal and undocumented workers. It's saying the employers are going to be subject to those same misclassification fines and penalties. Let's vote yes on the Schultz amendment to the amendment. Further discussion? Representative Nelson. Madam Speaker, members, I thought I made myself clear. The letter I got from Deed Again, this is not necessary as it's already required. This is already required, so we don't need to pass another law to make them do something they're already required to do. And so I, like I said, vote red on this amendment. Any further discussion to the amendment? You have to stand for me to think that you actually want to talk. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'll, I'll do that throughout the remainder of the conversation tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, so, uh, to this point, we are we want to hold to the exact same standards. I'm hearing Representative Greenman talk about that if you if you want to move forward um, with the additional misclassification standards, that we want to ensure uh, that 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 there are penalties. 
that there are penalties to going about hiring uh, folks who, who came here illegally. And uh, this, is a, this is a great thing to do, especially to hold to the same standards of uh, the misclassification um, bill. So vote green. Thanks. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment to the amendment. Will the clerk please call the names of the members who are voting remotely? Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and 66 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment to the amendment is not adopted. On the underlying Nelson amendment, is there further discussion? Uh, there's no roll call on that. All those in favor of the Nelson Amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Mecklen moves to amend House Law Number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is quoted A55. The member from Sherburne, Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we had this conversation. This amendment goes to, um, I believe it was Representative Kraft's bill, about 70 percent mandated energy standards in new construction. In that testimony of his testifier in support of this idea, they gave a story where they built a house and it was only 8 percent higher than the normal building cost, which, as a, somebody who's done this, I found it a little bit odd, but because I've never been able to pull that part off. But in that, Afterwards, it became, I was informed that, in, that for that project, that land was donated. So you add that to it, that would make a much significant difference in the cost of that project. Furthermore, even at 8 percent, folks, $32,000 more per house on average for the, for the median house. Yet, just today, Representative Keeler said on, on regards to House File 8393 that homelessness, a very big issue. Yesterday, Rep. Yuakim, kids cannot learn when, they're, when they have no roof over their head. So we have this massive homeless issue. We have a significant lack, lack of housing available. We have the highest energy building standards, and we're going to mandate this to the building code. Now, to that part of it, for those that don't build things, Often new materials come to the market, and it seems to be the latest and greatest thing. I would think anybody that's into the high energy standards would agree spray foam was a good item opposed to bad insulation. I think that would be a fairly common consensus. The first rendition of spray foam turned out to be a miserable failure, but we didn't know that for about five years. When you start mandating building products that are new, it's often four or six years later before we realize they have significant flaws. That's why our building code is usually six to eight years behind what's currently happening in the market. Having legislators tell builders through the Department of Labor best practice, and this is what we're going to do as code, is a horrible idea. And Madam Speaker, I ask for a roll call. Representative Mecklen requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion to the Mecklen Amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Speaker and uh, Representative Meckland. So a few clarifications. Uh, you made a comment about 7 to 8 percent. That is true, the development in um, Northfield. 
and it is 7% more, uh, more costly than code, but that was the building cost. It had nothing to do with the land. Um, and uh, there's actually a, a builder up in Grand Rapids who's showed me how he's doing it for you know, a half to 1% today. It's got a great new wall concept. He calls the Minnesota wall. Sam Friesen, we gotta check it out. Um, but the, the, the bigger point here is this bill is about setting our path over, you know, between now and 2038. The 70% reduction in emissions isn't, isn't required to happen today. It, it's over three-year changes by 2038. Other states that have done things like this, Massachusetts um, did a focus around passive house, and what, which, which is kind of the, the, the goal or the, the, um, the level of emissions reduction we're talking about, excuse me, the level of energy efficiency improvement we're talking about. And after a few years, when they were focused on it, they found that the increase in upfront cost today was one to three percent. So what we're doing here is we're very responsibly saying this is where we need to get to. The 70 percent reduction is actually stuff that you, you can actually get today with uh, building these ways, but we're saying that's where we're going. That's based on some, uh, also some modeling done by the Center for Sustainable Building at the University of Minnesota. So this is a responsible way to get to where we're going. And by the way, when we do that, we not only have a, a uh, cost-effective upfront cost, but you're reducing your ongoing costs substantially, 60 to 70 percent. So um, I uh, appreciate Rep Representative Mecklen's comments and concerns, but I would ask for a no vote. The member from Lyon, Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, too, um, I rise in support of the Mecklen Amendment. You know, I think, you know, as we're looking at the issues that are before us, one of the things we hear over and over and over is the cost of housing in the state of Minnesota. And, you know, it was stated during uh, Representative Mecklen's presentation of his amendment that, you know, it's been reported that up to 8 to 9 percent this could potentially cost in the increased cost of housing and the ability to produce and, and build housing. Well, I can tell you folks, when you have interest rates of seven, eight, potentially nine percent, depending on what type of a loan you have, it's not just eight percent increased costs. What is the finance cost of those increased costs? It's going up, folks. So you potentially have an increase, not just of that principal, but of the increase to finance that increase. Now, where I come from, the role of government is to lessen the burden on people. Lessen the cost of living here in the state of Minnesota. I get it. I get it. Well, well, we'll help you save money along the line. Well, we have folks that can't even afford to get in a house now. Can't afford to pay a mortgage now. And yet, what is the market indicator we're giving to home builders across the state of Minnesota with a bill like this? If you, the majority decides not to adopt the Mecklen Amendment is, you know, we realize that housing costs are high. So the St. Paul knows best attitude is, we're going to make it go higher. You're welcome. Representative Mecklen, I thank you for this amendment. You know, as you look at people's background and what they do, Representative Mecklen is a guy who gets up on a roof, fixes the roof, looks at windows, fixes it, rips out sheetrock, fixes it, does the things that make homes retain their value. He understands costs and labor. When we add to the cost of labor and add to the cost by state mandate, on paper, yeah, sounds great. Hey, we're going to make these homes more affordable, more efficient. Oh boy. Well, shoot, 
We can't. We got folks that can't afford to jack squat right now. You know, how efficient can you make a tent city when folks can't find a job? Representative Mecklen, I appreciate your amendment. I think it's thoughtful. I think it's in the re living within the reality that real Minnesotans are facing in this economy. The cost of living's going up. And how does St. Paul fix it? We're going to make it go higher through state mandate. Give some folks some relief. Let the relationship between a builder and the buyer, we hear that over and over again, well, the market's driving this. The market's driving the green revolution with a little state help with a mandate. Folks, if someone chooses the best way to build their home because they can afford to, let them. If folks just want to kind of get the bare bones built so they can provide a roof, a wall, a bathroom, let them. It's fun to have goals, but keep them goals. Don't have them mandates. Don't bake into the cake higher costs for Minnesotans. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Edelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I just want to take a moment here um, and acknowledge uh, two people in the chamber. Um, I, I apologize um, to just kind of drive us off the bill for just a second. Um, Eric from the little shop um, on the corner is here. Uh, in these late nights, he helps stock all of the supplies to make sure that we're all fed and have snacks and water and Mercedes uh, are here in the back. And I just, if we could just take a moment and acknowledge them in the chamber, I would be grateful. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd, I would like to speak in support of the Mecklen Amendment, and I want to talk about some practical realities of what we're facing right now. So the, the Mecklen Amendment would make it so that the capital expenditure of a house would go down based on what we're trying to get done in the bill here. And that's what I really want to focus on. Let's talk about CapEx versus OpEx. Representative, you and I share similar goals, Representative Kraft, on, uh, I think we even had a conversation around the, our, our shared affinity for modular houses and walls that can be built in a factory on a jig, but that's not really contained here. You're tinkering in, the, in a different way. So let's remind ourselves of a study that has been done that has not been disproven. It is incontrovertible fact. For every $1,000 you add to the price of a home, you price 4,000 potential buyers out of the market. That's a lot. $1,000 increase in price, $4,000, 4,000 people pulled out of the market. So think of your kids, my kids. They would like to buy a house, perhaps in the district or in the town that they grew up in. My wife would like that. We're trying to, to nudge that along, encourage that a little bit. But here's what is happening. You. Representative Kraft talked about ongoing costs. We're going to lower the ongoing costs, is what you just told us a couple of minutes ago. However, that's not the impediment to acquiring the new house or new to them house. The ongoing cost isn't even in their, in their thought horizon. They're looking at the reality of acquiring the house right now. They can't. And if you put this in, if, if we don't let the Meckland Amendment get engrossed, that's the reality. We're going to have an increase in cost, and we're going to have fewer and fewer people being able to buy a house. Now, I, I'm all for making houses as efficient as possible, and on my list of things to do this summer is to re every window and crevice on the outside of my house. If you all want to help, 
come on over, because it, it's not a great job. It kind of stinks. However, when we are making things difficult on the front end for people to buy a house, that is a thing that we should reassess as we move forward. You've heard a lot of us talk, and Representative Kraft and I, and Representative Howard, I know you're listening online, and a number of others. We talked about the right now housing crisis. We're 106,000 housing units undersupplied in the state of Minnesota. So here's a great idea. Let's make it harder to buy it to build a house. That sounds like a fantastic idea. It's not. The long-term costs are certainly something that should be talked about, but not with this level of a punch in the face right now, because what's going to happen to people if they're trying to live up from underneath this, this heavy burden that we're, we're actually going to tell builders what they have to use, once again, we're going to make it very, very difficult for that first-time buyer with interest rates being very, very high, now the price of the house, the base price, the CapEx price of the house is now going to be untenable. Certainly, let's talk about the ongoing costs. Let's find a way to make it so that people don't get four or $500 bills for heating in the course of the winter. That's fine, that's aspirational, I believe. Somebody said that was the word. But you have to, real, you have to come to a reality check, Representative Kraft, the ongoing cost is markedly different, if not drastically different, than the CapEx, the upfront cost. Ongoing, sure, have at it. Try to, try to make the house as efficient as possible. But that purchase price where you sit and sign 4,000 documents that you really aren't sure necessarily what you're signing when you buy that house, that's what Representative Mecklen is trying to fix right here, right now, if you accept the amendment. Thank you. Support the Mecklen Amendment. I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker and uh, members, and thank you, Representative Meckland. You know, this is an issue we've been dealing uh, with around here forever. It's this balance of, um, of regulations and costs, and that's really what this comes down to. And what Representative Meckland is trying to do is make sure that given the state of the cost of home building, home buying, home renting, we cannot afford this. And not only can we not afford this, you know, this just happened actually. In Kansas they did this. And do you know that a builder, not a single builder, not just a particular builder, not a single builder pulled a permit for a home for four months. Not one permit was pulled for four months. The builders didn't know what to do with this. It's that difficult, it's that expensive to get this done. Builders didn't even pull a permit for four months. And then it was literally one permit by one builder. It's just not workable. And it's just, it's such a contradiction. On the one hand, the Democrats are literally pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into housing, while on the other hand, they're increasing the cost of housing by hundreds of millions of dollars. And this idea that you are going to reduce the ongoing cost for families, guess what? If you can't afford to buy a house, you don't care. If you can never get into that house to begin with because the Democrats have priced a house out of the market for you, those, those ongoing savings are irrelevant to you. They don't exist in your life. That's like, what do they call it now, girl math? When you, when you like say you return an item and you got some money and so all of a sudden it's free money, this girl math, that's what these ongoing savings are. It's like they're girl math, they're, they're, they're foo-foo dust, they don't exist. If you can't buy the house to begin with, those ongoing savings are irrelevant to you. And guess what? Do you know that home buyers 
can do this right now. Home buyers can meet these standards right now. They can choose these ongoing savings right now. They can choose it. They can choose it. There is no restriction right now. Any home buyer can put these things in place if they can find a builder who's willing and able to do it. Any home buyer can do this can do these things right now. And some choose to, but you know who chooses to? Very wealthy people. Because it's very expensive. The average homeowner is doing everything they can to minimize their expenses, right? I know that there's another provision in one of these bills to ban, um, to ban fluorescent light bulbs which, or, or the, the mercury in light bulbs, which I love because I'm old enough to remember when Democrats uh, required them and banned incandescent bulbs and we had to go to the mercury-filled light bulbs. So it's kind of cute. But... We did that, and now we've moved on to LED lights because it's more efficient. It saves money. It doesn't use as much energy. So homeowners choose that. And homeowners who can afford to choose these things do. I've got a friend who put solar on their home. They love it. They love it. But it cost them $60,000 to put solar on their home. The average Minnesotan cannot do that. Just like the average Minnesotan cannot afford these new mandates that you are putting in place. The average Minnesotan simply can't afford it. And your ongoing savings, your ongoing magical savings are irrelevant because they're not buying a house to begin with. They can't afford it. And you can snicker and you can smirk, but it's just the truth. And I'm really excited for you that clearly you can. Maybe, maybe you could afford it. Good for you. But that's not most of us. This immediately prices the vast majority of young people out of purchasing a home. Is that really what we want to do here? Is that really the goal? All these, all these mandates make no sense. It's already happening. We are already reducing our energy consumption. We are already increasing our, our efficiency. Because frankly, the market has afforded us that opportunity and it does save us money. So we choose it. Enough with the mandates. Thank you, Representative Meckland, for the amendment to remove this egregious man mandate. This is a mandate that is going to prevent home ownership in the state of Minnesota. And folks should vote yes on the Meckland Amendment. I recognize the member from St. Louis, Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support this amendment. Um, before I got this new gig, I was doing carpentry, built houses in northern Minnesota. Seeing exactly what we're talking right now, a normal house, you'd go in, you'd build it, stick built, put insulation, sheetrock, put it in, caulk the windows, all the new tools now make it go faster. But no, we got new standards we have to do. You have to, if you use spray foam, you have to caulk every joint. And this caulk is super special. You have to, and, and when we try to do it, the normal carpenter, it, we don't have the tools, we don't have the, so we have to go out and have someone else do it. And then the rules that they have to abide by to do that. Pretty soon we're, this house that we thought we would be done with in three months is six months along the way, because you can't get anybody to work uh, that has the, the right equipment that makes the standards that we've set that came from the University of Minnesota's studies and everything. So I, I sit in some of my committees and I'm, I'm like, what, what, I'm, tr I'm still trying to put all this together because I, 
I don't understand how these standards, where the idea comes from. Someone has an idea that this insulation is better than that insulation. The house I live in was built in the 1930s. There is very little, if any, insulation in the walls. Sometimes the drapes move. I'm okay with that because I know my house breathes. The wood on it is still from the 1930s. There are homes that were built in the 60s that have to be torn down because they rotted from the inside out, because they're not vented properly. All these new rules that we have to abide by have other rules that go into it. Uh, the venting now, you have to have air exchangers. Then someone has a new idea running the air exchanger underneath the heated floor so that the cold air of the outside gets warmed on the inside and then it comes inside, but now it's full of moisture. So now you got all these things and it comes from these new residential code standards. It's, at some point, can you just come out in the field and ask us what's working, what's not? We'd gladly tell you what's good and what's bad. Um, we're trying to keep that dollar down. I, I don't want to charge the homeowner any more than we have to, but it just seems like all we do is we keep going, we keep going, we keep going. So I, I know it's late. I know we want to get going tonight, but I couldn't sit here anymore after building these houses and complaining about all these new rules coming. I have to say something. Please support the amendment. Thank you very much. Further discussion on the Mecklen Amendment. Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just a couple really brief things. So um, the, there was a mention of some things in Kansas. It was actually Kansas City. They, they had some code that was adopted by their city council. It's not what's happening here. We don't do things at a city by city basis. We do things statewide. We're not adopting any code here. We're actually um, uh, instructing the professionals at the Department of Labor and the Construction Codes Advisory Council to look at it and adopt the right kinds of codes for Minnesota. Um, I, I do think ongoing costs actually have a big, big deal when you're talking about um, the houses that are built to where we're trying to go to in 2038 that are, that are running 20 to $40 a month in terms of utilities. That's electricity, heat, and, and, um, and, and light. So um, I think that does make sense. And, the other, can, the other thing we have is, um, you know, buildings are 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota, and residential is a bit over half of that. This is a responsible way to address that so that we don't have significant upfront cost increases, have healthier, more cost-effective homes that lower costs long-term. So please uh, vote against this amendment. To the author of the amendment, Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So to your $20 a month theory, I think most Excel bills, Excel bills now have a 20 plus month surcharges on them anymore. So I don't know if that's even possible. It's just that part alone. Um, to much of what we heard here, and Representative Kraft, I, I, I've been working on this for years, but from the customers who can afford it, who want it, who see a benefit in it, typically they're younger. A couple looking at retirement right now that's gonna invest in this, they, they, even if they save $200 a month, when they're adding $60,000 in initial investment, do you think they're ever going to get the return on investment? It's, it's so many people have come to me when they get the cost, they, they walk away from it because that geothermal unit, they, they, they'll never, it, it won't save them enough money in enough time. That's their conclusion. But you start pushing this forward and you can say like, well, this is a goal by 2038. Let's go over a little bit of history since I've been in this chamber. We had... I think it was 1920, we had, they wanted to reinforce the block wall and there was a half wall in the back of the house for wind load. I want you to think about this for wind load. So the wood wall built it on top of it didn't need any additional wind load, but the mason block wall at the bottom had to have rebar put in the cores for wind load. They were pushing that. Came out to about $8,500. No offense for Representative Elkins, but then we had street impact fees, 10 to 12 grand per unit. Now we have EV plug-ins on every stall. Depending on which electrician you talk to, whether it's on new or existing, fifteen dollars to $4,500. We had Representative Nash say for every $1,000 that goes up, $4,000. That number was actually from about three and a half, four years ago when the interest rates were half of what they are now. I would suggest that would probably mean in just simple math, if it was 4,000 people lost availability to that product, we're at least at eight now. All we hear about is homelessness, tent cities. 
There is nobody that, I mean, our homes are so much more expensive here than they are in Indiana, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota, and Iowa. The same house here that Lennar builds here, they build in Indiana for 130,000 less. Help me understand why that is. You want to add another 30 or 40,000, plus I'm sure we'll have street impact fees coming back at us one of these fine days. But this is the methodology in Minnesota of how to create affordable housing. So what do you do? You throw $2 billion at it last year to housing. So what? If you make less than a certain amount of money, you'll qualify for perks so you can buy down all these mandates that are put upon all of us. We already have the most highest energy efficient building standards in this nation. The state already puts us that. In fact, in our continuing education, we have to do every year, they dedicate one hour of the day must be on energy efficiency. So this kind of stuff to me, is it, it, it's surprising to me that you, you think, that people who don't go out there and work in the field think that they know how to make all this work. In this study you refer to in Kansas City, it is the exact same policy. Yes, it was by a city but it's the exact same the theology that they were trying to attempt. And you, what, you know what happened out of this? When they finally pulled the permit, because they would go submit the permit and they couldn't hit that goal. You can shake your head no, but you can call this builder too and ask him. So they walk in there and this is the standard that they were, the, the building official was held to. Okay, that didn't work. They go back to the drawing board. What ended up happening, they increased whatever they use, whether it's solar, whether it's geothermal, whether it's spray foam, Whichever methodology, triple panel windows, I don't care which one you pick. They ended up having to reduce the quality of the house so much, so significantly, to hit all the rest of the benchmarks. But at least they got past it, so somebody's house is finally being built. That's the outcome that we will have. Perhaps uh, Representative Hollis is here. I supported her bill last year for tiny houses. That's what you're all going to be looking at. Vote green. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Carol. Howard. Howard votes no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabke. Tabke, no. Tabke, no. Carol. Here you go. Carol, no. Carol, no. <clears throat> The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 yeas and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schultz moves to amend House Law number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A74. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, there has been a conversation happening this session about the federal dollars that are coming to Minnesota for the rollout of broadband. We are so excited for the $652 million that will help Minnesotans across the state. Um, get access to broadband. Rural broadband is exceedingly needed, and we are getting close in Minnesota to our goal of reaching every Minnesotan. $652 million is going to do a lot for us in order to get there. Um, the A74 amendment is really about a conversation. We need to ensure that we aren't putting the kinds of restrictions on the rollout of the, these dollars, the $652 million worth of federal dollars that are coming here to Minnesota to implement broadband, we need to ensure that that, that those dollars, that that is implemented as quickly as possible, that we aren't putting the sorts of policies in place that would slow up the deployment of rural broadband and broadband across the entire state. So there's a conversation happening with the people who do this work, both the companies, the employers, the employees, about how we're going to do this effectively here in Minnesota. 
I will say a few other things that are incredibly important. We need safety. We need to ensure that the, Minis that the Minnesota workers who go to work to deploy broadband in this state, we need to ensure that they're safe, that they're keeping our communities safe. Deploying and installing broadband, broadband can be a tricky business to be in, but it needs to be safe, and we need to have some level of standard around that. And that's important. But it needs to ensure that we aren't adding costs to the consumers and shrinking the pie of the $652 million that were sent here by the federal government. We need to ensure the accessibility, the affordability of broadband for all Minnesotans while also benefiting Minnesota workers. We need to have good safety standards that keep people safe, but we also need to ensure that these dollars are getting, getting out into the community as quickly as possible. And so I hope that as we continue to work towards the end of this legislative session and find the solutions that will best represent the voices of Minnesotans, that we work together in a bipartisan fashion, ensuring that we get the results that we want from $652 million worth of federal investment into broadband, and that we work in a bipartisan fashion to get that done with all stakeholders at the table to ensure that those dollars aren't impeded on their way to implementation. With that, Madam Speaker, I'm going to withdraw the A74 amendment. Representative Schultz withdraws the A74 amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> McDonald moves to amend House Law number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A56. I recognize the member from right, Representative McDonald. Madam Speaker, uh, my particular amendment deletes a uh, portion of the bill that's a prevailing <clears throat> wage requirement for financial assistance, which in, his, in Representative Nelson's bill, the bill expands low income tax credits and tax increment financing to the state's existing prevailing wage requirements. Uh, what's happening right now in the districts and communities with tax increment financing, they're taking impoverished lands or blighted properties and uh, building up uh, uh, senior housing, affordable housing, and other developments that are critical in our economy and critical in our communities. It's working now, and it does not need to be uh, 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 added with prevailing wage because that will only increase no the cost of these very important well, projects. Thanks. Now I understand the good folks that are in the trades that are building our homes and building the buildings and Should building these uh, important senior housing affordable and affordable housings Karen are very good, homes. talented, skilled workers. Minnesota has some of the best of the best and we certainly don't want folks coming from North Dakota or Iowa or Texas or anywhere else coming to Minnesota stealing the jobs from good Minnesotans. Our skilled tradesmen, our electricians, our brick, our plumbers, uh, pipe fitters, you name it. We have some of the best of the best. Our trade unions and our merit shops are the best of the best. And I think that uh, that has to be made clear and I think we all can agree on that. But by adding prevailing wage it will increase the cost of all these very important projects that are happening in our community. Now, although there's no empirical data, because we have not gathered, we've done our due diligence, we do know that in prevailing wage does increase the cost of important projects. But equally important is the fact that our workers, and I'll repeat it again, even though my wife says when I get up and speak, I should not repeat myself, but this is worth repeating, they are the best of the best in our state. And I want Minnesotans who build our roads, who build our homes, who build our buildings, and affordable housing, senior housing, apartment buildings, you name it, are the best. Quality, skilled laborers. That's more important. And if we have to pay a little bit more for good quality, I think we Minnesotans understand that. But we still equally have to be fiscally responsible for any state project. For example, the building across the street, no bids whatsoever for that project. For those who were mayors and city council members, you knew that you had to take at least three sealed bids before you awarded the project to build a city hall, to build a, uh, a building, to build a fire department, to build anything that, recall, re that required city tax dollars from your citizens. That building across the street did not. And that's one of the reasons it cost so damn much, because we didn't do our homework. Oh, darn much, I'm sorry. So my, pardon my French. So just let it be known 
that with this provision, Representative Nelson, potentially we will increase the cost of very important projects in our community. It's working now. There's really no reason for this particular provision in your bill. But for those good workers that will build, continue to build with tax increment financing and low income tax credits, that is important. And for those reasons, Madam Speaker, I will withdraw my amendment. Representative McDonald withdraws his amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schultz moves to amend House on number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A53. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Got some bad news for the chamber. Bad news. Bad, bad news. We spent 30, we had a 36.5% increase in state spending, and we increased that state budget to about $73 billion. And now, on the horizon, we have a deficit. A deficit is on the horizon despite $10 billion worth of tax increases. And inside of this bill, inside of this bill, there is an appropriation for over $9 million for one entity, one workforce training center, but the Workforce Training Center isn't going to be owned by the state, isn't going to be owned by a county government, isn't going to be run by a city or a local economic development authority. No, 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 no. Under this bill, we have nine and a half million dollars going to a nonprofit called Tending the Soil. And you can read all about them. I've shared some um, information about them tonight, so that can help inform your decisions. But let me just say, while this is set up through the lens of talking about this being some workforce training center for the greater Minneapolis community, this appropriation, number one, we don't have the money for. We straight up do not have it. When we're thinking about what the future holds, Minnesota kids can't afford this because the dollars are going to come straight from their classroom. Straight from their classroom. And the thing about this is another major reason that we don't need this appropriation is because we have state colleges and universities that are here to prepare Minnesota workers for whatever field that they need to go into and desire to go into. The future of tomorrow can be found in the training that you can find at Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. And this legislature, in its infinite wisdom, passed a, a bill called the North Star Promise that allows for families under $80,000 a year of household income to go to college for free, to get the skills and the training that they need. And while that is the case, it would be duplicative and wasteful of us in this body to pass a bill for a nonprofit to the tune of nine and a half million dollars when our institutions of higher education that can provide for this workforce training are seeing declining enrollment across the state in almost every single corner. This is wasteful spending that we can't afford. And for that reason, I request a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion on the amendment. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. Thank you for uh, your arguments and uh, insights, uh, Representative Schultz, I appreciate that. Um, but this is a unique project. Um, and uh, what it does is bring together community organizations and unions and others uh, to create a training center for the future, uh, security personnel, uh, the 
new jobs in the green economy. Um, we also have uh, so many people who are left out or can't access other uh, job training programs that will be uh, able to utilize this. So for that reason, I would ask for a no vote on the um, amendment. Further discussion? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Oh, I'll defer back to you, Madam Speaker. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, I just wanted to rise in support of the Rise Up Center. Um, this is going to be an investment in our workforce, which is something we've heard quite a bit around here and particularly in the Labor Committee. And in particular, this is an investment in private sector workers who are, we're, we are in desperate need of. So some of the, of the apprenticeships that this expanded space will allow us to grow on are window cleaners, community safety specialists, uh, green certified cleaners, commercial kitchen certification. Um, this is also an existing building, so it's good stewardship for this neighborhood. And most of the, pro the, member, the workers who will be served here are actually non-union members. And so this also not only serves members and helps them grow, it also creates a pathway to union jobs and higher wage jobs. Um, there is also, I just want to clear up a misconception that this is only for the Minneapolis area. This is actually for organizations serving over 27 counties in this state. Um, they include Cook, uh, Crow Wing, Stearns, Isanti, Sherburn, Wright, Olmstead, Goodhue, Blue Earth, Rock, Nicolette, uh, Wasika, Anoka County. There's counties all over the state that are partnering with organizations, including the Building Trades, including Unidos, to help people serve all sectors of our uh, work, particularly the private sector, and all corners of our state. So this is a good investment. We continually need these jobs. These are some of the same jobs that many of you have advocated for here tonight and some of these workers. And this is an investment in those workers across the state. So members, this is a great program. Thank you, Representative Hornstein, for championing this uh, Rise Up Center in your neighborhood. And members, I would encourage you to vote against this amendment and support the Rise Up Center. To the author of the amendment, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is a good amendment. I'd really do encourage support, ultimately because this is duplicative. This is completely and entirely duplicative. We have, as an example, in the private sector, with our trade unions today, they have training facilities across this entire state. And there are job opportunities galore. Great paying union jobs galore. And $652 million worth of broadband investment that our trade union members get to do. And you can get trained with membership in our trade unions here in Minnesota that do fantastic and tremendous work. In addition to that, in addition to that, Madam Speaker, our Minnesota State Colleges and Universities can take you as someone who wants to learn the trade, and they can give you the skills, and you can do that for free in Minnesota so long as your household income is under $80,000 a year. In addition, we have a deficit on the horizon, and placing more money into the hands of nonprofits that have questions abounding about their values, about their accountability. For these reasons, Madam Speaker, it's important that we adopt this amendment, the A53 amendment. Vote green. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. <clears throat> Howard, no. Howard, no. <clears throat> Kegel. Kegel, no. Kegel, no. Tabke. Tabke, no. Tabke, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 yeas and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> 
Greenman moves to amend House Law Number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A81. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, um, and thank you, members. Um, uh, we were set to, to talk about the misclassification fraud um, bill, and so I will not um, uh, uh, do much, but I will, do want to talk about this amendment that uh, we, we're going to offer to 4444 and are going to offer here to make it um, conform. Um, for folks who have been in committee, um, uh, just briefly, what misclassification fraud is, um, it's when you treat a worker um, who should be an employee as an independent contractor, and when you do that, um, uh, what happens? is a worker can't, doesn't get unemployment insurance, they don't get workers' comp if they get sick, they don't get earned safe and uh, uh, sick time, they don't get minimum wage, wage an hour, and the, uh, um, the UI trust fund doesn't get uh, uh, reimbursed. The um, uh, uh, homeowners and, and everybody don't um, uh, um, it is get cheated. So. With that, um, what this amendment does is it is in response to um, lots of conversations we had with, uh, with business associations, um, with, with builders, with the trades, um, and it reflects a few um, clarifying uh, and, and changes. One, it requires that misclassification violations um, be knowingly and uh, repeatedly uh, if uh, for individual liability to attach. We talked about that a bit earlier. It expands the safe harbor provision for determining when employment relationships attach based on conversations um, that we had um, with some trade associations. It requires DLI to apply Section um, uh, 14045 factors, um, which uh, um, they already uh, do when they consider penalties, um, when they're considering stop work orders, um, and it pushes back the effect effective date for March 1st, uh, 2025 for the 14 factor construction test and the stop work order revisions. Uh, members, um, I'd ask you to uh, vote yes on this amendment. Um, these are good provisions that make the bill uh, stronger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Or Madam. I recognize the member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Yeah, Madam Speaker, Representative Greenman, just a question for you, um, because this is an amendment. Now, we were prepared to discuss this and had several amendments uh, on 4444 uh, several days ago, but uh, can you assure us that uh, that will come back to the House? As I said, we have several amendments, and we certainly can spend a lot of time with this. Uh, those in that committee, the Labor Committee and others, uh, were keyed up and teed up to discuss this further, because we believe this will be very, very damaging to our business and economy here in Minnesota. Uh, so we certainly have a good hour or two, and I'm not exaggerating, there's no hyperbole, uh, because of this bill. But if you can assure us that it's going to come back, that we can have ample time later to discuss this fully, because it is an important issue, we will hold off on uh, our work. Madam Representative Chair? McDonald, are you asking Representative Greenman to yield? Well, I believe I am. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative McDonald. And as you know, um, I was very prepared to, to have this conversation uh, two days ago, and discussion went long. Um, I, what you're asking is a question for leadership, um, not for me. I am fully prepared to have that conversation. I saw um, and prepared for your amendments, and they were actually um, very reflective of the conversation that we have been having in the Labor Committee and beyond. So um, uh, whenever we have that conversation, I'm looking forward to it because uh, I think this is a good bill. Thanks, Madam uh, Speaker. Representative McDonald. Madam Speaker, would uh, Majority Leader Long yield to a question? He will yield to a question. Me Representative McDonald. Uh, Representative Long, this issue is important to us, and I'm sure it's obviously it's important to you. Uh, as you probably heard, we are teed up for many questions and many uh, amendments on this particular issue. We take it very seriously, uh, as we do on all issues. But uh, it is late in the night. We have a couple of more, uh, another bill to get to. Can you assure us that this particular bill, 4444, can come back to the floor so we can uh, have it really uh, discussed thoroughly as we intend to? Representative Long. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question, Representative McDonald. That is certainly our hope. It's why we moved it to the floor, as we would like to have a standalone vote on that. Obviously, we've been running behind our schedule, so I don't know that we are going to get to that today, but that is our hope. Representative McDonald. Well, we uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Representative Long, we want more than hope. We wanted assurance. And uh, with a little insurance, maybe a little prayer and hope, we won't go for two hours on this one particular amendment. So, uh, Representative Long, would you yield for a question? 
He will yield for a question. Representative McDonald. Majority Leader Long, can you give us some assurance more than just hope? Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, we're not going to be able to get to it tonight, I don't believe, given the amendments that are uh, left over. Uh, I cannot give you a specific date when we will get to the bill. We are running behind. The debates have gone very long on some of these bills, four, six, seven hours. So I cannot give you an assurance about when we will bring the bill back, but I am hopeful that we will, and I'm hopeful that we will have time. That is certainly our intent. Representative McDonald. Well, uh, that's not exactly what I wanted to hear, Representative Long. Uh, we really wanted some assurance. And I'm not playing any games here. It is an important issue. We discussed this thoroughly in caucus uh, for many hours. I'm sure you did as well. And Representative Greenman is keyed up as well. It's an important bill to her. Uh, but uh, we really need some time to discuss it. So if there's no assurance, I guess we're going to have to continue on the important debate we have regarding this particular amendment. Madam Speaker. Further discussion on the bill. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, would, would Majority Leader Long yield? He will yield to a question. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Majority Leader Long, are you aware of any pending, not pending, are you aware of any active huddles happening right now uh, between the two bodies on, on bills that have yet to pass both bodies? Representative Long. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think the representative will have to be a little more specific. I can't read tea leaves. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, uh, Representative Long, uh, are you aware of any pre-conferencing of bills that is taking place uh, right now between the House and Senate um, without bills having already passed uh, the floor of, of either body? Representative Long. Madam Speaker, Members have questions across the uh, bodies all the time between the House and the Senate. That's how good legislation happens. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, and so what you heard tonight, members, is that there is, there are meetings that are happening already to pre-conference bills, trying to get agreement on bills between both bodies before that they've been pro appropriately debated and discussed, taking the input of everybody, of every Minnesotan. And that, that's, that's concerning because if we are unable at this time to get the sort of commitment that we're looking for from the House majority as to the details on worker misclassification, then the members of the minority are left with more questions, Madam Speaker, because if their pre-conference committee meeting in small groups and huddles over the details and the language of the final agreement, then that's cutting out the voices of Minnesotans. And I, I'm not sure why would we, we would be doing that if they haven't already passed either body, and both bodies, frankly. So I, I'm concerned to hear that tonight. And Fortunately, I think we can dig pretty deep into our desks full of paper. I know I probably have about 500 pages worth of stuff here across two desks. But at the bottom of this, somewhere is the details on worker misclassification. And I guess what I'm hearing so far tonight from the majority leader himself is that all of these meetings, all of these pre-conferencing of bills are happening out of the public's eye, in the dark of night, like tonight, in formerly smoke-filled rooms, and no, nobody from the public is there. And so the bills that come here to this body over these last few 10, 11, 12 days worth of session might already have full agreement from a complete DFL trifecta that we already know has been wholly irresponsible on behalf of the people of Minnesota. Madam Speaker. For what purpose do you rise? Point of parliamentary inquiry. State your point of parliamentary inquiry. Madam Speaker, what order of business are we on? I, I see up there it says A81, but the, the member is not 
talking about anything having to do with the A81. We are on the Greenman Amendment, the A81. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Liebling. What we're talking about is worker misclassification. And tonight, there is this additional amendment to this bill, and we haven't yet had the chance to take up the amendments and don't have those ready. I mean, I have mine for 444 right here, but that isn't 5242. So what we're trying to say here is that Minnesotans, Minnesotans deserve a public discussion and discourse in accordance with the rules of this body and the Constitution of the state of Minnesota to ensure that the public is not left out of the lawmaking process. That's what we're talking about here tonight. And so as it relates to this Greenman Amendment, the A81, we need additional clarity. We need additional clarity to ensure that the decisions that may be made be the decisions that are in the process of being made, potentially behind, behind the scenes, behind closed doors, away from the public, we want to ensure that, number one, Minnesotans' voices are heard. And number two, Madam Speaker, a concern with this is that within the construction industry, a concern is that because of the things that might be decided behind closed doors, in the dark of night, we're concerned that the decisions will result in the full consolidation of the construction industry. Consolidation into major general contractors that limit the voices and the people who choose to be small business owners, who choose to live the American dream, who choose to make an investment and bid through the competitive bidding process. And we're concerned about worker misclassification that may, that may make it too difficult, too encumbering for small businesses and individuals who want to start small businesses and operate as subcontractors to execute upon contracts in the construction realm. We're concerned that the decisions that are going to impact small contractors because of the worker misclassification bill will result in higher costs and a delay in the timeline of projects. Maybe I should have said that in reverse order. A delay in projects resulting in higher costs and limitations for small businesses. That's, those are some, that's just one of the impl implications of the current worker misclassification standards. In addition, there was a working group that worked on worker misclassification throughout at least the last year, and Representative Greenman could probably tell me, probably even longer. But as a part of it, the concern has been that construction contractors have been hiring people who aren't Minnesotans, who potentially came to this country illegally, and we want to ensure that the decisions that are made in the dark of night, behind closed doors, away from the public, we want to ensure that the decisions made by this legislature benefit Minnesota workers benefit Minnesota union workers and non-union workers, and that it's Minnesotans who benefit. That's what we're concerned about tonight. So I would just add, there's a lot of questions about worker misclassification, and I think it deserves a hearty debate, which is what I think this minority is hoping to get from the majority leader and from the majority party. That's what we're trying to get is the answers, to be, the, the answers to these questions to be made and, and, and for the solutions to come, but to be dealt with in the public light. 
with all the people at the table, with all of the stakeholders involved, to find the best bipartisan solutions that will suit Minnesota workers best, to ensure that we aren't heading in a direction of more irresponsible and unaffordable policies for Minnesota, and especially Minnesota homeowners, and people seeking to invest in our state who want to build new buildings. And worker misclassification standards are going to greatly impact those things, greatly, greatly impact the cost involved to build a home, to build a business, to literally construct a business, but also to build a small subcontractor. And it's incredibly important that we find those right solutions together in the public eye. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I have heard the Greenman bill at least twice. And here's what I'll say about Representative Greenman. She is not afraid to talk about this bill. She's not. And she and I disagree on many things. We might agree on 11 or 12 things. We, we, but we're, we're friendly. So I think that I hope the majority leader can give us some level of assurity because Representative Greenman is not afraid to have a frank conversation. She's not going to shirk that. And right now, it's 10 o'clock, and the conversation that really revolves around 4444 is a much longer than a two-hour conversation. We've had it in committee, and I've, I've shared some of my grave concerns, and I know a lot of our team have grave concerns, because it, it's, it's a very wide-reaching bill. So I would ask that we come up with a, a day on a calendar to put 4444 on the House floor, Let's move on with this bill, and let's have some respect for not just our, our members, but our staff here as well, because this grinds on them also. Let's, let's do the right thing and take the amendment that you had. I think it was Representative Nelson, but I think Representative Greenman was going to offer it. Strip, the, strip that language out of this bill. We can dispense with the whole conversation around the language of 4444 tonight, move on, talk about the other things. Then we can, we can bring up at a later time some of the concerns that we have, and I've shared them in state government finance. I've shared that I have the, my best friend in the world, and we spend hours together on his boat fishing. That if 4444 becomes reality, it's going to have wide-ranging implications for him. But we can't necessarily go through all of our concerns tonight on this. And perhaps naively, we were under the assumption when we saw the amendments table that this was going to be stripped out. And we thought, oh, well, that's good. We'll talk about this when 44 or 44 comes to the floor. We'll give it its due. We'll have a frank conversation. We don't need to encumber everybody with that conversation on this tonight. And I would hope that that's what we would wind up doing. I would hope that the majority leader, who has been in the back and we've been having conversations, that we can say, you know what, because it is such a big deal that the A80 has to, has to get brought up, I'm, I'm not, I don't think it's been offered yet, if you want to change authors, give it to me, I'll take it, I'll offer it. That way you don't have to be viewed as killing your own language in your bill. I can be the bad guy, it happens every day here apparently. But here's the thing. We can either finish this bill or the alternative is all of our members who have grave concerns with this. And I, I look along the seats here and I see people who are in the trades. I see people who are tasked with being concerned about this. I, I know people in our caucus that they themselves are subcontractors and they employ subcontractors. He's sitting over there, but Mecklen's somewhere else. There he is. Found him. Where's Waldo? This is important stuff, and it shouldn't be trivialized by giving it this brief period on the floor. 
you still probably have the votes. Nothing to be afraid of there. If you've galvanized your caucus, you can still have 44 or 44 come to the floor. No problems. Everybody that wants to vote for it can vote for it. Everybody who wants to vote against it can do that. But now it's becoming the choice between finishing this bill or taking it past the time where I don't, I don't want to, I will, but I don't want to. So I would say, I, I will, I'll ask the majority leader to yield to a question. He will yield, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Long, uh, I, I do respect, I think we both share sort of a process orientation. This, I don't believe, is the process for this hefty language. It's a lot in here. And I believe that you felt the same because there was an amendment that was drafted to remove it. Will you have one of your members or will you allow one of our members to offer the amendment stripping this language out tonight, forcing a conversation on the floor at a later date when you can bring 4444 to the floor? Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question, Representative Nash. So House File 444 was calendared for Monday, April 29th. Our intention was to take it up on Monday and pass it on Monday. The reason that we had the amendment offered on A80 was because we believed that we were going to have passed it on Monday. We did not pass it on Monday because the conversations and debates were extraordinarily long on Monday. We did not pass it on Tuesday because the debates were extraordinarily long, including a seven-hour debate on education. We were heard that this could have been done in two hours. You could have certainly shaved off two of the seven, and we could have gotten this done beforehand. But we have budget bills that we need to move. We're trying to finish this bill today. We're not going to take up the A80 tonight because we didn't pass House File 4444 earlier, and that was the choice of the minority. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, to quote the Speaker, Speaker Hortman, we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of the season of disappointment. And I would say that the majority party, when you calendar that many bills that you know will be contentious and will bring voices and conversation from the minority party, and you calendar them all on one day, that that's not a realistic expectation. And to divert blame to us asking questions and doing our job. And I would remind you, I'll go back to my first two sessions in the majority. There were many of your members, and I see many of them here staring at me tonight, still here, that you kept us on the floor until 3, 4, 5 in the morning with a blizzard of amendments. So please don't for a moment think that you're innocent in this. It's been done before. And we didn't blind you with amendments. We just had lots of questions because quite often, we don't get to have these discussions to the full extent that we would like to in committee. We get cut off, and I've been cut off a good number of times in different committees. So the floor sometimes is where we do these, these works that we are, we are asking to do tonight. So I would ask, do the right thing, offer the A80, A80, Take it out of the language. Let's move on. Let's hit the goal to get everybody out of here by midnight because that's a good thing to do. But if the scenario is jam this through now, don't bring up 44 or 44 later, well, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. That's just physics. I would hate to think that the remainder of our time here before we sine die would be an exercise or a lesson in the implications of physics. You can do the right thing. You can do the right thing. Let's take this out. Let one of us take it up. We'll take the A80, we'll offer it. We don't even have to roll call it because your assignation of, of a new author would be your willingness to do the right thing. What Minnesotans will think if you do it this way is that you're not brave enough to have a conversation to the level that a bill like 4444 would command. 
And once again, my friend, Representative Greenman, she's not afraid to have this conversation. There were a couple of times after committee, she chased me out of the room talking about things like, hey, Nash, Nash. And I was happy to have the conversation, respectfully, because we do respect one another. Let's have a respectful conversation. Let's do the right thing. Let's offer the 80. Let's take the, take the language out, move on so Representative Nelson can finish, and then whoever's offering the housing bill can walk through that, and then we can be done. Or we have a lesson in physics. Thank you. I recognize the member from Candy, Ojai, Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and again, I, I want to just say that this is very alarming that uh, the um, mis misclassification bill that we had prepared ourselves for, and quite honestly, Representative Greenman has done it too. And to kind of hear leadership is giving you new directions, and we got to try to cram it in tonight with three pages versus your maybe 15, 20 page bill that you had been working on for a long time, because it's a very complex bill. This misclassification uh, of workers has me concerned as well with, a, with an employer that we need to do some work on this issue. I think that there's some very valid reasons why your work this summer and this fall with your task force and meeting all around the state of Minnesota requires more than a slip in an A81 amendment. This is not how this should work. And if the majority is frustrated because things are going a little bit long, you guys run the House floor. You run this management of this, of this institution, and this is not a place to throw in a complicated bill. So I do really hope that we can find the time and we can get an assurance that we can spend time on that really important bill that you have worked hard on. I know there's things in there that I actually agree with. There are things that we need to get right, but um, this isn't how we do this. I hope that we can set this amendment aside for now and come back to this. Uh, but workers in Minnesota need clarity. The, the subcontractors out there, the contractors that have done this successfully should continue to do so. The ones that are skirting the rules, the employers that are using it incorrectly need to be stopped. And that's what the intention I know of your, your important bill is, is all about. But it's complicated, it's not easy, it's a bill that needs time. We have suggestions and ideas that should come along with this and um, uh, we don't need to do this through this process right now. So uh, members, I just really hope that we can have further conversations about this. Uh, um, this A81 amendment does not belong here at this point. It needs more conversation. Um, I urge, I urge uh, the majority to take a look at this and uh, we have another plan for this. Thank you. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, I think um, we should be uh, real careful about, about uh, this kind of gamesmanship with, with the structure of the rules. And, and um, you know, it's, it'd be very easy for us to pause this and have a full and fair discussion about House File 4444, um, which has a lot of, I mean, there's, there's, there's a interesting um, and concerning policy issues that I think are driving this, and, and I, I do uh, respect the work that Representative Greenman has done trying to go through the process. I think there's still some work that needs to be done, but um, thank you for the, the conversations you've had with, with me, and I know with many other people, uh, both on this side of the aisle and stakeholders on this issue. Um, and I think it does a disservice to the process that that has gone through for the, to you, to play the kind of game that's being played on House File 4444 tonight, using a sort of a combination of a few different rules. And let me, I, I want to kind of walk through those uh, just in case anyone is um, unsure about how the, what the sort of combination of rules has been that's, that's preventing us from having an actual full debate on House File 4444 tonight. Um, okay. All right. I guess I'm going to stop. 
Representative Greenman, to the author of the amendment. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, um, and I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to respond to. Um, what I will say about this amendment, um, whether we're having this discussion now um, um, or in the future, is um, there has been an incredible amount of work done on an incredibly big problem, um, and and as has been alluded to, working with um, uh, on this the Attorney General's task force, along with uh, the committee process, really has uh, worked and shown. Um, um, the way that it can improve and really structure a bill. So um, that's what this amendment is about. It is about um, incorporating some of those learnings that we've gotten from a broad set of folks, both workers and business, and I'd ask for your support. There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> McDonald moves to amend House Law number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. <clears throat> the amendment is coded A73. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Madam Speaker, my amendment has to do with the email. Yeah, I know what it, I know, I know what it means, uh, Representative Schultz. Has to deal with, thank you, Madam Speaker an email that we got from the Sergeant of Arms the other day regarding the odor, the diesel odor in the state office building. Construction on this prodigal building that uh, it is going to cost a lot of money, $730 million, is making people physically ill. Now some of us are actually physically ill by the cost of this project and the uh, lack of transparency that has been around and surrounding this stinker to begin with. So because of the email, we were notified that some people might have to vacate the building because they are getting physically ill. We're told not to open the windows, even though it's getting nice out, and it becomes a very serious issue I presume that most of you believe it's a serious issue too because of the Sergeant of Arms email alerting us to the situation of the stink and odor. And I ask myself, how can it be, have so much odor when most of us are over here for the last two weeks? You know, uh, I was reading the other day, and I'll make this brief, in my daily scriptures, the prodigal son, that's out of Luke chapter 15, and I decided, uh, I knew what the prodigal son and the, uh, the passage means, but I wanted to look up prodigal, prodig the prodigal definition, just to remind myself what it is, and it reminds me of this building and the fact that we should be vacating it. But prodigal means uh, prodigal expenditures of unneeded, squandered inheritance given to extravagant expenditures, expending money or other things without necessity, recklessly or viciously profuse, lavish, wasteful, not frugal or economical. And frankly, folks, that is the building that your side decided to build without even legislative approval, without even a three-bid process that gives the taxpayers an opportunity to build a project fiscally responsible. We require all of our municipality and government entities to do so in a closed bid process, but not that project. It is indeed a prodigal building. I'm ashamed that I'll even have to step into it if I'm still here. I'll be brief again. This building was 320 some, or what was it, 350 million to renovate the capital. The Senate office was of approximately $92 million to build. And it is a build of beautiful building for the senators. The building across the street, I think we should be uh, really embarrassed that your side approved a $730 million building. When we had the cash, you at least could have had the audacity to pay cash for it with the $18 billion surplus that we had last year. 
and you could have saved a couple hundred million dollars in interest. Folks, not one of us would do that in our own home budgets or businesses. Not one. We'd pay off the, the debt if we had the cash on hand. You wouldn't go in debt and pay that kind of interest. $200 million when you had the money in the bank. It's a, it's a colossal mistake. And I'm sorry to inform you, we're going to remind you of it often. Because it's irresponsible spending. So because of the email from our Sergeant of Arms and the stink that's over in the building from the construction sites, my amendment would cease the construction and vacate the building out of safety. Not for necessarily us, because we're over here in this building, stinking up this place, but for our staff, the revisor's office, our, uh, and everyone else that is working in the SOB. Madam Speaker, one of our members particularly was getting ill, amongst many, but one particular friend of mine, Representative Marion Rerick, and I would ask her to yield for a question. She will yield for a question, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Rerick, would you please inform the body the serious issues and how it had an adverse effect on your physical body? Representative Rerick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, just really quickly. I mean, this is something that I've raised in Rules Committee at least three times, I think even four times. And it isn't just me that was physically ill, um, but there were multitudes of staff and members that were ill on the second and third floors from the diesel fumes. So it was the diesel engine smoke that was coming in the whole building repeatedly over and over and over, over the course of at least three weeks and maybe more. Um, and, you know, I understand that they're doing renovations just outside the building, but we shouldn't be subjected to diesel fumes and these noxious fumes that continue to come in and sicken people. They've gotten migraine headaches, uh, probably from the lack of oxygen and you know, really bad sore throats and stomach ache and uh, coughing and lung issues and all kinds. We, we have a couple of ladies that are pregnant on the floor and they're terrified of what could happen with all these fumes that continue to fill the building. So. Uh, it isn't just me, but it's uh, many, many people on the second and third floors. And they construction equipment has been right in front of the building and in front of our air intakes. And, and, you know, we've talked about this over and over and over and over again, and it hasn't been remedied. Even this morning, Representative Scraba right here was in a committee hearing in the basement hearing room, and the whole room filled with diesel exhaust, and he... Uh, made notice of it and other people in the room um, made notice of it and it was pretty noxious. So even this very morning it was happening, Representative McDonald. And you know, it's, it's really unfair to subject our staff in particular to this continual uh, toxic fumes that continue to come in and it's very, very toxic. So uh, the diesel fumes are not just an odor, they are an actual toxin that make people very sick, and we have many people that have been sick for quite some time. So thank you for asking, Representative McDonald. Further discussion to the amendment? To the author of the amendment, Representative McDonald. There we go. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so it is a very serious issue physically for all of us, particularly our staff and the revisor's office, anyone up in the higher floors particularly. So uh, the amendment would cease the project to ensure safety of all those who are working over at the SOB. I hope that the legislature finds that it's uh, your safety, the safety of our staff and members are more important, and the public, because they're over there too, more important than sometimes cost. Now I know and recognize that CSUN uh, the project momentarily has costs, but in this particular case, I'll put safety above costs. I hope you do too. Uh, with that, I think I will ask for a roll call, Madam Speaker. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Long, for what purpose do you rise? Point of order, Madam Speaker. State your point of order. Under Rule 3.21, uh, Germanus, this brings in a new subject. There is no discussion of the State Office building renovation in the underlying bill. It is certainly a real issue and one that the Sergeant's Office is working hard to address, uh, but it is not a subject of this bill. Advice. 
Representative McDonald. My advice, Madam Speaker, is safety is uh, Trump's germaneness. Wouldn't you agree, Majority Long? And that's my advice. Safety trumps germaneness. I've studied the amendment, I reviewed the bill, I've considered your advice, and I'm ruling that the point of order is well taken. There's an amendment at the desk. Uh, before I go to the amendment, I will actually move to having represent the member from Hennepin, Representative Egbaje, speak to the uh, housing piece of the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so for the next part of this large bill, we're uh, going to focus primarily on housing. Um, before I get started with kind of what the section entails, I want to make sure I get the thank yous in. Um, so first and foremost, I want to uh, thank our nonpartisan staff who's been with us through the way um, on putting this bill together, Justin Cope, Katrina Highmark, and Mary Davis. Um, I also want to uh, thank our uh, partisan staff, uh, Jack Dockendorf, Emma Erdahl, Molly Peterson, and Jacob Grundhauser. I think without them, we would not have been able to do this bill. And also, thank you very much to the members of the committee. Uh, we had very robust discussions on a number of issues pertaining to housing, particularly how important it is, um, how we need to be building more, and how we just need to be doing more across Minnesota to make housing uh, much more affordable for many more people. Um, so I wanted to start with that first. Oh, and also a shout out to Representative Howard, who couldn't be here tonight, so hope you're watching. Um, home is our center. It's a necessary fixture in our lives that gives us the foundation we need to be healthy, happy, and have the best chance to thrive. But we know that for hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans, this foundation is either unattainable or is severely at risk. Our state faces a massive housing shortage, and that is driving up the cost of rents and the cost to own a home. In fact, more than 600,000 Minnesotans are cost burdened, family, homelessness is increasing, and we have shelters that are full. Last year, we passed a historic investment in housing, and those resources are just beginning to make a difference. And the bill before us today builds on that foundation and focuses our attention on housing stability and the Minnesotans who are most at risk of losing their homes. And we are deploying resources where we can to make sure that they have the most immediate impact. So we did only have a target this year of $10 million, um, but most of that is going to be dedicated to emergency rental assistance and rapid rehousing. And we're doing this because, as I mentioned, homelessness is on the rise. This money will have a huge impact and it can be deployed very quickly. Also, many Minnesotans who are aging, are uh, their affordable housing is at risk. And so they're at risk at displacement because um, our nonprofit affordable housing providers are also facing unprecedented financial challenges. Seeing skyrocketing costs in insurance, security costs. They're also seeing declining revenues because of rent collection um, and vacancies based on the coordinated entry system. But we also know that they have a lot of rehabilitation to do in their buildings, which they hadn't uh, previously seen at levels like this before. So in order to address that important issue, we're creating a grant program which is designed to stabilize affordable housing for Minnesotans in these properties that have significant financial distress. So what we're doing is we're going to repurpose $50 million from last session that hasn't been implemented yet to address some of these shifting crises. We also have a bill um, in this section to create a task force to continue, continue to work on those underlying challenges for our nonprofit housing providers, so that way they can uh, grow into long-term solutions to address their financial stability. That, we know, is a responsible way to address the crisis when it comes to building for the future. Housing infrastructure bonds are the best tools that we have in our state to build more homes. And so we've authorized an additional $50 million that will help when housing infrastructure bonds for both rental housing and home ownership housing. We also have in this bill a task force for HOAs. Uh, we know that a lot of people don't really seem to like their HOAs, so we're putting funding in to review those groups and develop recommendations about how to address the various issues that people are feeling from them so that way they can feel more comfortable in their own neighborhoods. 
We'll also include a, a meaningful number of policy provisions in our finance bill that are responsive to the challenges that Minnesotans are currently facing to maximize our public investments in housing and ensure that we're treating workers and renters with dignity. When we ensure that we build affordable housing, uh, when we're using public dollars, we want to make sure that we aren't doing them aren't using those dollars on the backs of workers who are building these housing. We also want to ensure that landlords can't refuse to rent a unit to a renter who does use part of their payment for housing through public assistance. And we also want to ensure that our new metro-wide sales tax and local housing aid dollars are maximized in going to those intended purposes to create housing stability and build more homes. Is this bill going to solve all of the housing crises that we have? Not, no, it won't. But it does give more attention, resources, and policy change at all levels of government to meet this moment. But what we can say about this bill is that it will be life-changing, and in many cases, life-saving for many, many Minnesotans. It will be the difference between a family who were the breadwinner if they've lost a week of work, are able to care for a sick kid to, and they can get through that rough patch and still keep their home. It will be the difference for a senior to be able to stay in their rental housing that they've lived in for decades. And it will be a new home that gets built to allow a hardworking mom to become a homeowner for the very first time. And that's what happens when the legislature prioritizes and invests in housing we can change lives for the better in Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Myers moves to amend House on number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A65. The member from Hennepin, Representative Myers. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I. Um, I'm bringing the A65 amendment here. What it's asking is that the commissioner is going to provide a report to the legislature on any detailed recommendations related to the new verification process for rental assistance. And, you know, like anything we do here, we want to have as much information so we can be as informed as possible, be better prepared, and, you know, have that data to make better decisions for the future. So I would ask everybody to support this amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Agbaje. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Myers, for bringing this amendment. Um, I think, you know, having that additional information and data makes a lot of sense, so I would also encourage members to vote yes on this amendment. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> <clears throat> Dotseth moves to amend House Law Number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A66. The member from Carleton, Representative Dotseth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, uh, my amendment is a real simple amendment. It requires the Minnesota Housing Agency to notify the chairs and ranking members when the election, when the electronic signatures are being utilized at the option of Minnesota Housing Finance are implemented. Real simple amendment. Member from Hennepin, Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Dasas. I agree it's also pretty simple, so we will go ahead and accept. I encourage members to vote yes. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Myers moves to amend House Law Number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A72. The member from Hennepin, Representative Myers. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The, the A72 amendment is um, something that we're bringing forward because of the uh, amount of investments that were made last year and what we see need to be made in the future. And so what this does is it's going to require an annual report from um, Minnesota Housing regarding, um, you know, how that money was used and what the impact is. And I would ask members to support that, but I do also have an amendment to that amendment. There's an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. <clears throat> 
Myers moves to amend the Myers Amendment to House Law Number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A96. Representative Myers. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I had a chance to speak with Chair Howard. Just this, what this amendment to the amendment does is give a little bit of clarification that is going to start with the funding that took place in 2023 moving forward. So I would ask everybody to support the amendment to an amendment. Member from Hennepin, Representative Ekbaje. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, thank you, Representative Myers. I think with this clarification, the underlying amendment becomes workable, so I would encourage folks to vote yes on the amendment to the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment to the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. The amendment to the amendment is adopted. Back to the underlying amendment as amended, Representative Agbaje. Again, now that the underlying amendment has been amended, I would encourage members to vote yes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment as amended is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <laughs> Johnson moves to amend House File Number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A84. The member from Asante, Representative Johnson. Madam Chair, members, this amendment is the uh, one that I think is, is important. What it does is, uh, in the current bill, on page 152, section 21, it increases the debt limit for Minnesota housing finance from $5 billion to $7 billion. Right now, with the ec economic uncertainties that we have, and ac actually yesterday and a little bit today, our, the numbers weren't as didn't uh, made, were made me worried as well. We have to think, is it time to increase our debt ceiling? We need to be responsible for the taxpayers' dollars. And yes, those dollars are, many of them are backed by our taxpayers, the citizens of Minnesota. Uh, later on, I'll let you know how deep that debt is, but Right now, I think it's a good time that we think about it. Um, we have to be responsible. We have to make sure that when we're doing this, doing this, it is the right time. But right now, I believe uh, I am going to withdraw this amendment, and uh, we'll continue on. The amendment is withdrawn. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Johnson is moving to amend House File 5242. The second engrossment as follows. This amendment is coded A85. The member from Asante, Representative Johnson. Uh, Madam Speaker, members, again, I'm, we're going to be talking a little bit about the bonds. What's interesting is last year, with a $1 billion increase in the housing budget, we put $100 million into a program. What's inter interesting this year, yes, they're going to take $40 million of that and put it into a different program, but they're going to replace it with another $50 million in bonding, increasing our debt. And I don't know if you looked at the bond prices right now. We're paying a lot of interest on them. Interest rates have gone up. This money isn't, and all of these funds have not been used. We could be making good interest on the dollars that uh, are in the bank just sitting there. But instead, we're going to sell bonds and pay five plus percent interest. Is that the proper use of our state tax dollars? Bonding is a good thing when the interest rates are low. But it's not the greatest idea when the interest rates are up, and right now they are up. I think we're better off using the cash for this program. We are, we are the responsible body for the 
tax dollars of this state. Finance bills are required to start in the House, then go to the Senate. I think it's important that we think about how we're doing it. We, ha we have to be fiduciary responsible to make sure that we're using the tax dollars properly. Madam Speaker, I am going to withdraw this amendment as well. The amendment is withdrawn. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Johnson moves to amend House Law number 5242, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A67. The member from Asante, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, just give me a minute. I seem to have lost that amendment. Which one is it? 67. Representative Madam Speaker, Johnson. members, the, uh, what this amendment does deals with a report that uh, on page 140 of the amendment dealing with homelessness. One important thing that I think we need to do with this report is not just find out where the, or how many people are homeless, but the origins of where they came from. What caused the, them to be homeless? I think it's important that in order to find out what's causing it, how we're going to fix it, we need to know where they came from. Did they come from other parts of the state? Did they uh, come from different states to, and came to Minnesota? I think it's important information that we have. I'm going to ask uh, members to support this. I think it's important that uh, to get all the information, all the data that we, in order to uh, work on this issue. The member from Hennepin, Representative Agbaje. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Johnson. You know, I do think it's always great to have more information in uh, a piece of research. Um, one of the things to note, though, is Wilder actually already does kind of collect this information about where people come from when they're homeless. Um, so at this time, I would say that it would be best to vote no so we're not uh, making duplicitous work for the Wilder Foundation. Um, in addition, we're also only one of the funders of, of, the sur of their survey, so we want to be sure that we're being prudent in what we're asking. But it is a, it is a set of data that they do already ask for. So um, I would encourage members to vote no. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, I'm glad they're doing it. Well, with this in statute, maybe we'll, we will get the information then, because right now, we, the report that we received, that information was not there. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Johnson moves to amend House Law number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A87. The member from Asante, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, this uh, deals with uh, Section 8 housing. Mandatory requirement that private owners of rental property have to take uh, assistance, Section 8 housing. Now, to, in order to qualify for Section 8 housing, you have to sign a, to get the vouchers on the housing choice voucher system. And you heard me, it's a choice. It's a choice for the property owner, the housing provider whether they want to participate in the program or not, because to participate, there's things they have to do. They have to have an inspection. And it's actually a very lengthy inspection. I looked it up online. Multiple pages. 
And in order to do that, they might have to do some major renovations. I think it's important that we leave it a choice. We shouldn't be forcing our housing providers to sign contracts with the federal government. In fact, I'm not sure if they actually can do it. Um, there's been some challenges in court, but the court challenges are not complete. We have uh, issues where if we do this, we could actually go backwards in our housing. Because what one of the qualifications for the program is the, uh, the amount that uh, the rent costs. So what's that going to do to our middle class citizens that are renting? In order for a housing provider to get out of the get out of that situation, they're going to have to jack their uh, rent rates way up. And that's going to hurt our middle class, especially those that rent. It could hurt uh, some of our seniors in the privately owned facilities because they'll have to increase that rent dramatically. I think we, instead of mandating it, maybe we should look at incentives for them to use it. Members, please support this amendment. I think it's important that we do that. To give our housing providers an option and not a mandate. Because what I've seen around here, whenever we mandate, it costs more. We put mandates on our schools, it costs them millions of dollars. We put mandates on our builders, and our construction workers, it increases the costs dramatically. Members, please support the amendment. The member from Hennepin, Representative Akbaje. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, members, I am going to uh, encourage folks to vote no on this amendment. This is the uh, section of the bill that protects renters who use some type of public assistance for their rent. Again, no one should be allowed to discriminate on a person for their housing because of the type of funding that they use to pay their rent. Um, we know that, again, this is going to be a proxy for discrimination against other protected classes, which is why we want to ensure that we have this protection in this bill. Um, Landlords are also in the open marketplace. And when you're in the open marketplace, there's some regulations that you just have to stipulate to, whether it's registering for a license or buying insurance or just doing things to show that you have a unit fit for habitability. And so part of that will also be saying that you cannot just outwardly deny folks who use public housing. Um, it was mentioned about the contract that landlords would have to get into. That only applies if you actually take a renter that uses public assistance. Um, if you don't end up taking a renter that uses public assistance, you never have to sign this contract. This contract also has various caps and limits. So most of the landlords in our marketplace, I think as many of the renters in this room would know, are renting their units way above those caps. So that's a different problem we should address, but we just want to make sure that all landlords can do this. There was also uh, an allusion to uh, recent court cases around this. Um, so Fletcher Properties, Inc. versus City of Minneapolis, they did have a ruling earlier this year, but that was favorable in that the court held that the ordinance that Minneapolis had for a similar provision did not constitute a per se physical taking. And so what this means is that there's no constitutional issues of any kind, and that's consistent with what we've seen across the country with the more than 20 states that have this. Um, and that case is also not up for appeal right now, so that case is done, and so our legislation can move forward. Um, so again, I would encourage uh, members to vote no, because we should not be allowing a loophole for discrimination in the marketplace. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, Representative Badge, it's unfortunate because what we're doing here is going to cause more problems down the road. 
We'll be discussing that a little bit more later. But it's unfortunate that we're forcing our housing providers to participate in the program. That they have no option in, even though the program is called Housing Choice. They have a choice. But we're not going to give them a choice. We're going to mandate. That's right. The last few years, we've uh, had a lot of mandates. And every time, it's cost more. It's done the exact opposite of what the plan was and what was said was going to happen. So it's unfortunate that uh, this is, I'm sure this is going to be voted down. But I wish that uh, we would take this. This needs some more conversation to make sure that it's done properly, done right, and we give our ho housing providers the choice that they want. Members, please support the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Nash moves to amend House File Number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A69. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The A69 would address lines 152.24 through 152.25. It would remove the subdivision that doesn't apply to not-for-profits as it relates to rent control. Uh, rent control in general is very, very cumbersome and difficult. It winds up creating a problem for those that own the buildings. And when we consider what happens here at the Capitol with not-for-profits coming to ask for help, we're going to perpetuate the problem for them. And uh, because of that, Madam Speaker, I would request a roll call on the A69. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Once again, Rent control sounds benign, it sounds benevolent, in fact, and what it winds up doing is for those that own the building, it makes it so that they can't raise the rent to cover the cost of making improvements, and you wind up with a building that will ultimately get dinged for being subpar below code or falling apart. So uh, I would appreciate the support on the A69. The member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. I'm asking for a no vote uh, on this amendment. Uh, these properties that we're talking about are uh, subject to a federal law that's called Section 42. Essentially, uh, we give massive uh, tax subsidies to these properties to the federal government, and in exchange, they are limited in the amount of rent that they can charge. And there's nothing we can do about that. That is federal law, so I, I appreciate that Representative Nash doesn't uh, like rent control, all of these properties are already subject to rent control. They will be, no matter what you do on this amendment. This is all about how we calculate uh, what rent increases are allowable in these properties. We're talking about senior properties in this case. The current law calculates by changes in area median income. So as everyone makes more money, they can charge more rent. But these are seniors. They're retired. They don't get AMI. So what the bill does, the underlying bill does, is it changes it to using Social Security COLA as the measure uh, of how we're going to increase rent as opposed to area and median income, which makes a lot more sense because seniors aren't working. And we know how their income increases. We have a very good measure of that, Social Security COLA increases. So members, this is not a vote about whether or not to have rent control. These properties are limited in their rent increases by federal law. You can't change that. We can't change that. That's just the status quo. We have to decide how are we going to calculate this, what's fairest to them, and we should do it uh, on Social Security COLA, not area media income. Member from Asante, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, Representative Stevenson, you are correct. They already are controlled. But unfortunately, in this bill, it's going to lower the, really lower and really limit the amount of increase and what's going to happen is the, with these privately owned senior housing providers, they're going to have, probably have to shut down because they won't be able to cover their costs for maintenance. 
We know that every once in a while, a roof, more than once in a while, a roof has to be replaced. HVAC has to be replaced for the entire building. Boiler systems have to be inspected and recertified every so often. Those are huge costs. <coughs> Unfortunately, when there are nonprofits, oh, that's right, we have uh, funds that uh, grants and stuff we have, we give them to cover those costs. And in this bill, they can uh, even get more because we can now make, uh, with this bill, we can make uh, publicly, public corporations to become nonprofits. So, members, please support the Nash Amendment. It's important to, uh, for our seniors. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for your support. Vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Hello, Kayla. Hey, you ready? Sure, what am I doing? You're voting no. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. There you go. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. Tabkey. Tabkey, no. Tabkey, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Nash moves to amend House Law number 5242. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A68. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Doing my part for brevity's sake, uh, the A68 would simply just delete the entire section uh, and it would get rid of the rent control uh, scourge that we would be looking at if this were to become law. I would ask for your support. The member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, except it wouldn't get rid of the rent control scourge because of federal law. These properties are gonna be controlled regardless of what you vote on this amendment. It's a question of how that rent increase is calculated. Please vote against the amendment. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill a third reading. Third reading, House Law number 5242, as amended. Third reading, as amended. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Well, it's like the trifecta of Nash. Well, <laughs> Madam Speaker, members, you know, all of these bills together are, they have sprinklings of decent stuff in them, but I wanted to focus around the fact that the deal was broken for 4444 to come out of the bill. I wish that we would have had that, uh, that actually happen. Please remember that physics actually is a thing and we're happy to issue physics lessons, but I wanted to talk about the housing part. You know, housing is very important to me and I, I, have, I have joined my colleagues across the aisle in having very deep and hefty conversations in trying to change the trajectory of housing in the state of Minnesota, because it does matter. And housing is that North Star moment for all of us. 
where, and you've heard me tell the North Star story, that's how our kids navigate their way home, like my son the sailor can navigate their way home, but they can't create their own North Star if they're not able to build or buy their own home. This bill, sadly, doesn't really tackle the issue of building new homes. In fact, with one of the things that are now in here, it's going to make it more expensive. And the upfront cost, Representative Kraft, is going to outweigh the long-term savings that you project for those people seeking to buy that first home. It's going to make it untenable and out of reach. And I, I, I have enjoyed my time on the Housing Committee. Chair Howard, you're out there in the ether. I hope you feel better. But I have enjoyed my time on the committee. I have joined my friend, Representative Hassan, in one thing last year. We made it so that you actually had to translate contracts into the language of the person who's going to sign their name to the contract. So I've tried to work with you. I've tried to find ways to be helpful. I've put my name on bills that haven't exactly made me the flavor of the month over here on my side at all times. But I wanted to have those frank conversations, and I wanted to hope that we could do something to change housing for the better in the state of Minnesota. But we failed. We missed the mark. And this is going to make that North Star moment, that North Star experience for people, much more difficult. And I am saddened by that. I had hoped that we would have done better. So while there are provisions in this bill, and Chair Nelson, I see you over there. Thanks for putting the, the one provision of mine in your part of the bill. I, I do recognize that there are components of this bill that have merit, but in the main, in the totality of the bill, it is not worth voting for. I will not be giving it my support, and I urge members to vote no. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from, from Sherburne, Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> um, well, I kind of have to agree with a lot of my colleagues. This, uh, this isn't going, it's going to increase cost of housing. And this, as a person who does this, I guess there's maybe one bright spot to that. I have to charge more, which means I'm going to make more because the costs are going to go up. So maybe instead of having to build 10 houses a year, we'll have to build eight, because I don't think very many are going to be able to afford them. Um, like Representative Nash has mentioned, the 4444, hopefully we have a day to have that debate, because that is a great concern. And I think there's an awful lot of occupations out there that would be negatively affected. So with that, I'll keep it brief as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This bill is massive, and I'm fearing that it's going to get even bigger. It's going to bloat a little bit, not a little bit. It's going to bloat a lot more government. A lot bigger hand is going to come in to strangle the life out of small business owners. And it's going to add costs to Minnesota families. It's going to add costs to Minnesota consumers. It's going to add costs to Minnesota businesses, making us less competitive. We are being so duplicative in this bill, spending money that we don't have, spending money that will only seek to enhance, enhance the deficit. Enhance the deficit, members. The budget deficit on the horizon because of the irresponsible budget of the DFL trifecta. Which is why we need to reject this bill right now. Because this bill hands more money to nonprofits who don't have the state's best interest in mind and because, because the services provided are duplicative, are duplicative to our state's building and construction trades and to our state's colleges and universities. So we're wasting taxpayer dollars, wasting it, 
which means there's going to be less dollars for the classrooms of kids and less money available to ensure public safety. In addition, this bill, unfortunately, contains this worker misclassification language, and we didn't have the chance to have that heard in the public eye with the debate and discussion between all of us. And that's sad and frustrating, considering the concerns that it's going to bring for small businesses and subcontractors across this state. Many concerns have been leveled about this. Many, many concerns about worker misclassification. From, from the concerns where employers are not given due notice, to the lack of safeguards as it relates to new mis misclassification enforcement and education partnership, the expanded violations, the expanded civil penalties, the overly broad nature of consequential damages, the penalties are not limited to intentional acts of misclassification. The provisions relating to the issuance of stop work orders, the revisions to the independent contractor test and contractor res registration in the construction industry. Members, we have great small businesses. We have great subcontractors. We need to root out the bad actors, but at the end of the day, the data that has been collected on worker misclassification over recent years says that there's actually only a handful, literally only a handful of instances where this has taken place. But the result of the heavy-handed mandate of the worker misclassification as presented inside this bill will harm small business owners and subcontractors who are doing the right thing. It will add additional layers of burden, of regulation, that will add cost to construction. Homes are already too expensive, and this bill makes it even worse. It's even more irresponsible. It's even more unaffordable. And that's why we need a robust debate on Representative Greenman's worker misclassification bill so that we can hash out these details and ensure that every Minnesotan has their voice heard in the conversation. We have time yet this legislative session to have that conversation, and it needs to be had because the concerns are going to result in a more expensive Minnesota when Minnesota is already unaffordable and irresponsible with a budget deficit on the horizon that is growing by the day. Vote no on this bill, members. The member from Otter Tail, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Representative Hornstein for um, all the work that you've done there. And it's been, uh, I really enjoyed being part of your committee. So thank you for that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things in this trans transportation bill that were beneficial. We did some things for small cities that were good. Uh, the one concern I've had throughout the whole process is really about climate change and just a climate agenda. And so um, I just want to, I want to talk about some of those issues because I think we need, as a state, we need to really fully understand uh, what's happening here to know whether or not we're going down the right road. Um, so in Newsweek in uh, uh, August of 21, uh, there were 30,000 scientists that contributed to a, uh, a study that was done, and they said that uh, there's, not a, there's not a climate emergency. We do have some climate change that's happening, but it's not an emergency. In uh, August of this year, August of 23, uh, 1,609 scientists got together. There was a combination of researchers, two Nobel laureates, also said there's no climate emergency. Uh, one of the 1,600 is the, one of the Nobel laureates. He's from the University of Wyoming uh, studying physics or working in physics. 
And he said, when it comes to measurements of weather extremes, observations don't show outside of natural variability. Well, this is this normal, what happens over 150 years. Um, there's heat islands, he said. The only place that they've seen variability that's changed and gone up is near cities. So in cities, we see difference in temperatures, and those pockets of heat move around a little bit. So that's something that we see. Uh, Kilty also said that, uh, um, you know, the COT levels, um, we do see some warming, but right now we're at 416 parts per million of carbon in the air. Uh, not alarming, according to them. Corn, for instance, we talked a lot about corn tonight. Corn grows best at 420 parts per million. Soybeans are best at 416. He said there's no climate emergency. Uh, warming is strongly influenced by natural causes, uh, and that's, and that's, no, that's a non-emergency. So we need to really make sure that we're not going down the road, wrong road. Sometimes government and academia gets it wrong. Sometimes. And, uh, you know, what they're saying is, is that, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we fully understand what's going on. Um, these mandates will cost us a lot of money in transportation. So every trunk highway project is going to have to go through a review. And then we're going to have to take the time to make sure that we do everything right according to climate change, even in, even in the rural parts of the state. I think in the metro area, that would be, that's fine. But in rural Minnesota, that's going to add a lot of cost. So um, I, just to finish up, I do have some real hope uh, for going forward uh, for the Transportation Committee. Uh, last Friday, I spent some time in the first grade classroom. And in the first grade classroom, they had a little project going on. They were growing corn in these little cups. And uh, so the, all the kids had their corn growing. It was up about this high. And, uh, but one little girl, her corn was just really, really small. And she said, uh, she said, it's a miracle. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's great. You know, the corn, you put it in soil, you add a little water. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I guess it's a miracle. She said to me, she said, no, Mr. Murphy, I ate mine. So, but anyway, <laughs> it's a little late. But, uh, but anyway, I want to thank you again, and uh, I'm concerned about it because I don't think we're ready yet for all of these changes with regard to climate change. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not going to speak about the bill. I just have a question for Chair Olson, if she would yield to a question. She will yield. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Olson, um, we met about um, how the labor provisions would be affecting uh, paid uncalled firefighters more than a month ago, and um, I was told we would get some clarification from Dolly on this issue, and I know there's nothing in the bill dealing with this, so if you could just provide an update of where that stands and if we will be getting some clarifying language from Dolly. Thank you. The member from St. Louis, Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So there is no earned sick and safe time provisions in this bill, and I trust that you're probably following along with the Senate bill and seeing changes are being made there, and I assume it will get worked out in conference. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. So are you going to be supporting the Senate position, M Madam Chair Olson? Representative Olson. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I don't believe you can ask me about my position if I am supporting or not supporting, so I'm not going to rise to a point of order on that, but I am not going to answer that. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Chair Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I apologize for asking an inappropriate question. I would just like um, to get some sort of clarity that this issue will be continued to move forward. Um, the firefighters in my district, this is a huge priority for them, and our chiefs have been working tirelessly on this. So I encourage Chair Olson and other members of the conference committee to please keep this in mind as you go forward. Thank you. The member from Martin, Representative Olson. Uh, the member from Asante, Representative Johnson. Members, Mad Madam Speaker, members. I, when we started today, I was trying to, or the other day when all these bills were put together, I was trying to figure out how they fit. And boy, do they fit. Because you need a road to get to your home. 
need, and the construction workers need to uh, have the road to get, the, get to where your land is to build your home. And then we need a home. But unfortunately, this uh, monstrosity of an omnibus bill doesn't help. It actually hurts. There's a lot of fiscal irresponsibility in it. It does nothing to, de to decrease the cost of a home. Yeah, I called you ahead. They had written you. In fact, it increases the cost of the home with number of mandates, number of things that increase costs for building the roads so your property taxes go up. Mandates for the construction workers, so your costs go up for your home. Mandates for what's in your home. Mandates of how you can build your home. Nothing but increasing the cost. We're over 100, 110,000 homes short in this state. This bill is going to make it worse. <laughs> unless, I mean, unless you want government-owned housing rental units. That's what this bill does. We have in this bill, there is public corporations to build subsidized housing. Nonprofit housing that's actually owned by the taxpayers for you to live in, to get the Section 8 housing because uh, the way things are going out, things are getting so expensive, we won't be able to live without it. It's sickening. Now, early I said I was going to talk about our financial situation and some of the things in this bill, but before I get too, f too far along, I re just remembered, last year we passed House File 647 in the omnibus bill. I have the fiscal note here for it. It's zero. The only thing on there is some fees and uh, department earnings, but the dash is zero, it means minuscule. But in this bill, we have half a million dollars from the housing to go over to judiciary to pay for a bill that last year was put in the bill and was never heard in judiciary. It was sent to judiciary committee and re-referred off the floor to housing and never went back, bypassing how this institution works, skipping committees. And now we're paying for it. Five hundred, half a million dollars would be, ni be nice for some of the programs we have to help those in need. But instead, we're sending it off to the Supreme Court. Last year, we spent one billion dollars in the Housing Committee. Increase of one, one billion. So we actually end up spending about $1.3 billion, but 1.12 was available for nonprofits, whether they're regular nonprofits or now the uh, new thing, the uh, public corporation nonprofits. We're also increasing the debt ceiling by $2 billion, putting more tax dollars on the hook for the citizens of Minnesota. Right now, we're currently paying about, I believe, I, I think Chair Howard would love to have $87 million extra in his housing budget for some of the programs, but that's just the interest payment we're paying on the bonds right now, and it only goes up. And our bonds that we currently have, without the another $50 billion or $50 million are not paid off on the housing bonds 
until I believe it's 1950 or 2058. That's when the bonds we currently have are finally paid off. Members, that's over 35 years, or just about 35 years before those bonds are paid off, and we're going to add more to it. We currently have over three and a half billion dollars in bonds that the taxpayers are on the hook for if something should happen. Right now we're at 4.6 billion of bonds in the housing. That's 250, 200, over 225 million dollars in bonds a year that we're, we're doing with interest of $87 million. Members, we are responsible for this. We are responsible for the, to the citizens of Minnesota how our tax dollars are spent. We're doing more bonds, and bond, in, bond in, interest rates on bonds is high right now. It's costing us more. Other things in this bill is not going to help. I mentioned the uh, private or the public corpora corporations for government owned housing units. That's not going to help because that, what that is is government run housing. And we saw in the, in the labor part of this bill, we're increasing the cost of a home. For some reason, I have the feeling that that side of the aisle does not want people to own their own, own home. They don't want them to build their generational wealth because they're making a home cost too much for the middle class Minnesota, let alone the lower class. Housing starts are down, part of that because the interest rates are so high because of Biden inflation. But this bill is not going to help. This is socialized housing bill. It's going to hurt Minnesota. Members, vote no. The member from Hennepin, Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'll just start out by saying it, it is kind of sad that Chair Howard isn't here, but um, we definitely do make a good team because he pinch hit for me a couple weeks ago, and so now I get to do the same for him. So I hope he's feeling a lot better. But I wanted to say thank you for running a really strong and great committee. Um, as I mentioned before, we had lots of really robust discussions about housing from across the spectrum, from uh, what we need for our shelters, what we need for our renters, and what we need for our homeowners. And in fact, last year, if people remember, we put in a lot of money for people to become homeowners. Um, and I really want to thank him because he really had that focus, especially this year, when we had a much smaller target of seeing where it needed to go to help people the most. And the policies that he's put in here are also going to be the same type of things that are going to help implement many of the housing programs that we have. So this bill helps with ensuring that people can stay with their homes, which is why, again, we put the majority of our funding in uh, renting, rental assistance. And that's primarily because we heard from so many people in our committee that needed help making the rent. And when they got that support from a program like FHPAP, we just heard so many really great stories about how everything in their life started to stabilize, they could gain control again, and they could be able to live the life that they wanted to live. So that's why we want to make sure that we are continuing to do that for so many more Minnesotans. Also with this budget, um, that we're, we're putting money into programs that will help us find more information to ensure that we can continue to use our funding in the way that's most effective for those who rent, and then hopefully in the future for those who will be owning their homes. Uh, the piece of the bill that I would have stood up for if Chair Howard was here is the piece on uh, the evictions. And so um, we did a, a large package both last year and this year to really ensure that people's eviction records would fall off after a certain period of time. The reason why we need to do this is because 
the longer an eviction record stays with you, you may have changed your life, turned your life around, but you need the opportunity to find that strong, new, stable place to live. And so with the bill that we passed last year, it was being interpreted in a way that was only going to start from the beginning, moving forward, that the three years that your case would fall would be starting from uh, 2024. So the funding that we put in this bill is to ensure that the courts can do the look back that they need to do so that cases that are older than three years, even if they started in the past or now or in the future, will have the opportunity to be expunged and so a person can start over. So that's why we have that um, over $500,000 in the bill. Um, again, housing is our core, housing is our foundation. If you don't have a safe place to live, if you don't have a safe place to sleep at night, everything else falls apart. So I thank everyone on the committee who helped work to put this bill together, and I encourage members to vote yes on this bill. Thank you. The member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Madam Chair, uh, it's been an honor and privilege to be the lead, the GOP lead on the labor and industry. I wanted to say some compliments to Representative Nelson and some concerns on the bill. At this late hour, I'm going to be uh, brief, uh, but I want to start out with the compliments to Representative Nelson. This is his last year, as you know, and uh, possibly his last big uh, omnibus prime bill. Uh, and uh, Representative Nelson is a gentleman and a diplomat, uh, a good chairman, runs a good meeting, and we had a lot of respect and kindness. We had good thoughts good debates, good disagreements, and some agreements. Uh, the particular bill at hand, there are some uh, important provisions in there, certainly Representative Nelson, uh, there's some good provisions, but also the provisions in it uh, will indeed potentially make it very costly, continue to raise costs to build and do business in Minnesota. And that is our gravest concerns. When we talk to our friends, uh, the uh, National Federation of Independent Business and the Chamber of Commerce, who has over 6,000 members, uh, they have grave concerns on the prevailing wage and uh, some other provisions that will increase the cost of production and building in Minnesota, causing potentially investors to invest in other states, our neighboring states, uh, North Dakota in particular. And if you haven't already listened to Kevin O'Leary's uh, suggestion and his comments regarding Moorhead and Fargo, I entertain you to listen to the, his concerns and why people are building in Fargo and not Moorhead and what's happening there with their economy. It's booming and we could be t potentially losing out because of more mandates and the cost of building. Labor and industry, I think we should change it to just labor because a lot of the provisions, Representative Nelson, and the bills that we saw really hammer industry mandates, uh, more fines, more penalties. If there's a clerical error or mistake, boom, there's a $1,000 fine. Boom, there's a $10,000 fine. Well, I'm sorry to err as human. Boom, there's another $1,000 fine. And that just is not good practice and not good business. And we will chase business away to our other states. It's evident that it's happening. But I appreciate your kindness and the way you run the meeting. Uh, your uh, committee also had uh, some great respect for our side. You gave us ample time to uh, express our concerns on the bills. We were never hushed up. Now, I heard in other committees that uh, the DFL stifled, stopped, and prohibited some of our members from speaking on their bills. That is wrong. It should never happen. But Representative Nelson did not allow that to happen. We had ample opportunity to express our concerns and or our support for provisions in the bill. With that, I regret, Res Representative Nelson, I cannot vote on your pr provision of the bill, nor the bill, three bills in one, that's even unconstitutional. We shouldn't do that, shouldn't we, Patrick Murphy? That's unconstitutional. Housing, transportation, and labor and industry in one big bill. What is it? Triumphus. It's not triumphant. So, uh, unfortunately, members uh, vote uh, no. The member from Dakota, Representative Berg. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I'm proud to support this bill. 
Uh, Democrats uh, in this chamber, we have never stopped delivering for workers. Um, that is what we promised to do at the beginning of this biennium, and we did so both this year and last year. We protected prevailing wage, we protected kids, uh, influencers, um, and we made sure that we live up to the values of the DFL. I want to thank Chair Nelson for being uh, a mentor, for being patient with me as his vice chair, and for providing me with the opportunity to grow in this work. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, it's been my honor to, to serve as the chair of the Labor Committee, Labor and Industry Committee. I want to thank uh, both the nonpartisan and partisan staff from both sides of the aisle that uh, helped make the committee go and kept us on track through the, through the process. I urge a yes vote on this bill. Uh, I'm very proud of some of the things that are in this bill. The workers misclassification piece, I've been working on pieces of that since I first got in the legislature 20 years ago. Um, the prevailing wage that, we, that people want to complain about, prevailing wages are set county by county. The prevailing wages are there to protect workers, protect local workers so that our publicly financed jobs, that their tax dollars are not being used to drive their wages down. They're going to get paid their wages. Their contractors have the ability to try and get those jobs because they're paying the wages that they're paying their own workers. That's money in our workers' pockets. That's money that goes back into the local economies, that pays taxes to the state of Minnesota, that pays taxes to their cities, their cities, their counties, and their school boards. So, members, this is a good bill. There's a lot of good things in this bill. Um, all three of these bills are good bills. Please vote yes. The member from Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's, it's getting late, and I guess I'm the cleanup here for this side of the aisle. Uh, but what a bill. Uh, labor, housing, transportation, other than the fact that they're here in this chamber, they really don't go together. Uh, so it's quite a challenge. My uh, other colleagues have told you why their portions of the bill are something that was worthy of a no vote and I'm gonna do the same thing on, on transportation. So I don't know if you know, but you know what happens to most people that win the lottery? After a few years, they go bankrupt, okay? Why is that? Because human nature says you spend and spend and you get into that habit and you spend more than you have. And we've got that situation here and it's some red flags that we all ought to be concerned with. We have quite a few different areas in this bill that's continued to siphon off trunk highway funding. We have, just as an example, $1 million that's going to go to plant trees. And there's many more options there. And we have this windfall from last year, all of the growth in funding and dollars coming into it, that it seems like, well, we're just going to take a little here and a little there and a little over there, uh, but we'll still be okay. But you know what happens to the, all those little pieces? They add up to larger larger dollars. And so there's, that's, that's the first red flag in, in this bill. Uh, the second is what I've warned about before in the amendments, and that has to do with the train mandates and federal preemption possibilities. Uh, we aren't sure exactly what's going to happen with that, but we're going to go full steam ahead um, with, without that assurance that we aren't in trouble. And, and that's a kind of dangerous thing uh, to, to really know about. Um, there was a concern that I had in regards to zero emission buses, uh, but Chair Hornstein had an amendment that really helped a lot with that uh, because it's going to take the onerous off of the large dollar price tag that it had. Uh, we have in this bill uh, Ramsey County getting a million dollars for liability insurance uh, for the St. Paul Depot in order to have um, the Amtrak come through there. Again, something is that something that the legislature should do or is that a Ramsey County issue? Uh, we don't know. Uh, then we have a lot of the, the discussions around greenhouse gas mitigations and project selections and safety. And we heard just a little while ago in the debate, uh, I think Representative McDonald talked about it, uh, here we had a situation where we're trying to 
mitigate greenhouse gas versus the safety of the people in, in the uh, state office building. Well, safety certainly wasn't a priority. And on top of it, we allowed the gases to keep, keep escaping, so we aren't even mitigating the greenhouse gases. Uh, it's, it's something that we need to continue to, to, to work on. Those are, are certainly enough for us to vote no. And so I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, I, I will also uh, tell Chair Hornstein we have a great policy bill coming forth uh, on a conference committee, uh, one of the best that I've seen. And so we can be proud to vote for that one coming out there. Uh, but this transportation bill, at least from our side of the aisle, has a lot of concerns for that. So in, in closing, I just wanted to say it, it has been an honor for me to have served on the Transportation Committee over the last 12 years. Uh, we, have, we have great staff. Joe Marble, who's sitting over there, uh, has been a stalwart uh, person and, and one that if you want to know how to put together some amendments, he's the guy to go to, right? Uh, I know Chair Hornstein is always uh, anxiously looking for that list of amendments that we put together uh, for his bills uh, because it's an opportunity for us to discuss the differences. We do have to remember that part of us, when, when we really want to do our best legislative work, we need to be able to listen and be willing to accept that maybe we could be wrong, maybe we could learn, but not to be stuck with whatever we predetermined before. A wise leader, a wise uh, a businessman, understands that he doesn't know everything. And when he goes into a, a problem or a program with preconceived notion and is unwilling to accept or even think about other things, uh, he doesn't go as far. He's not as successful. We continue to need to do that. So uh, thank you to all of the people that have helped. Um, I thank you to the, the people that I have learned over those 12 years. Uh, Chair Hornstein, uh, you and I have had a lot of discussions. Um, I've grown on you and you've grown on me and we've kind of helped mold each other as well. Uh, I appreciate that. Other members of the committee that have come and gone, uh, we've all learned from each other. And so I, I thank you for that. But unfortunately, this isn't the bill that we should be passing this year. Uh, we should be doing better than this. We could work better and do better. But because of the largeness of the bill, it's not going to go uh, as well as we would like. It's going to be one heck of a conference committee, I can tell you that. So with that, uh, please vote no. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, thank you, Representative Petersburg, for your comments. Um, and members, I'm going to agree with uh, Representative uh, Brian Johnson, who said earlier that it actually does make sense to have uh, labor and um, housing and transportation together. Because when we think about transportation, it is really about creating jobs and building infrastructure. And that's what we do in this bill. That's what we did in the previous biennium. And um, it has just been a real honor for me to chair this committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for giving me that honor. Um, that, Madam Speaker. And um, uh, I've had the opportunity. This isn't a, a retirement speech. Maybe it's a transportation retirement speech. But I've had really incredible mentors over the years. I don't know how many of you remember Bill Queasley. Uh, who uh, was the first chair I served under, Mary Liz Holbrook, chaired this committee. Um, and of course, Bernie Leader, my absolute mentor, and so many people knew about him. Um, Mike Beard, and uh, probably um, the funniest chair of the Transportation Committee has to be Paul Torkelson. So um, I've had a real opportunity, as you said, Representative Petersburg, to learn from a lot of different people, incorporate uh, uh, their perspectives and values. So members, again, a good transportation bill covers all parts of the state. We do that. A good transportation bill includes all modes of transportation. We do that. A good transportation bill uh, involves safety, creates jobs, and uh, addresses our uh, climate crisis, and we do that in this bill as well. Uh, please vote green, not only for transportation, but also for labor and for housing. The clerk will take the roll on the bill as amended.
I know, we all promised you. The chief clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. There you go. Carol, aye. Carol, aye. Howard. Howard votes aye. Howard, aye. Cagle. Cagle, aye. Cagle, aye. Tabkey. <coughs> Tabkey, aye. The clerk will close the roll. What's the deal? Just, just one second. They weren't supposed to vote for Lawrence. Okay. We got him off. Got him off. Okay. Oh, sorry. Close the roll. Yeah. The clerk will close the roll. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 60 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. Without objection, we will revert to messages from the Senate. <clears throat> message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file. Herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments the concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file number 3438, an act relating to consumer protection. The message is signed Thomas S. Bodern, Secretary of the Senate. Greenman moves that the House refuse to concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 3438, that the Speaker appoint a conference committee of three members of the House, and that the House request that a light committee be appointed by the Senate to confer on the disagreeing votes. Announcements by the Speaker. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. That is my motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. Announcements by the Speaker. <laughs> announcement Madam by Speaker. the Speaker. Madam the Speaker, Speaker announces the appointment of the following members of the House to a conference committee on House File 3438. Greenman, Ream, and Dotseth. Madam Speaker. For what purpose do you rise, Representative Schultz? Point of information. What motion did we just vote on? The motion that the clerk read was that Greenman moved the House to refuse to concur in the Senate amendments in House File number 3438. Calendar for the day. The, the clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> House file number 4975, number four on the calendar of the day, an act relating to state government operations and finance. Majority Leader Long. Madam Speaker, I move that House file number 4975 be laid on the table. Representative Long moves that House file 4975 be laid on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. The motion prevails. The next bill the, on the calendar for the day is House File 3431. The clerk will report the bill. House file number 3431, number five on the calendar for the day, an act relating to state government. Majority Leader Long. Madam Speaker, I move that House File 3431 be laid on the table. Majority Le Leader Long moves that House File 3431 be laid on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? 
The motion prevails. Motions and resolutions. A copy of this order. There are copies of the non-controversial motions at the House desk and online. If there is no objection, we will take action on those mo motions first. Hearing no objection, the motions prevails. Hearing no objection? Yeah, I said that. It's right on the script there. I did. I said that already. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Mueller moves that House Law Number 5413 be returned to its author. The member from Maurer, Representative Mueller. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This bill was just not uh, something that my community was ready for, and so I'd like it to be returned to me as its author, please. Thank you. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. <laughs> Walgamon is introducing House Resolution Number 3. A House resolution designating May 5th to April 11, 2024 as Tardif Dyskinesia Awareness Week. The resolution is being referred to the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Announcements. Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 11 a.m. Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. Representative Long moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 11 a.m. on Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Long moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion prevails and the House stands adjourned until 11 a.m. on Thursday, May 2nd, 2024.